Hi everybody, Zeev Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master. And in this video, I'm going to show you exactly what you'll get when you join the all new Suture Academy and help you decide if Suture Academy is the right system for you to take your surgical skills and confidence to the next level starting right now. I'm also going to tell you about some of these exciting bonuses that you'll be receiving with the program. Now the value of these bonuses is close to $3,000. Yes, the value of the bonuses is greater than joining Suture Academy. But I'm including these bonuses because I'm committed to your success with this program. And I'm going to tell you all about these incredibly valuable bonuses in just a moment. We've got a lot to cover in this video, so let's get started. So if you've been following along with the past three videos in the series, I showed you how suturing can be made simple and how you can gain clarity and confidence in suturing over a short period of time. The z system and the step-by-step -step video tutorials are revolutionizing the way we teach suturing. We now see how dentists going through Suture Academy are gaining confidence and clarity and are able to implement the principles they are learning in a short period of time. No doubt about it. With superior suturing skills come superior surgical results. There's no doubt that suturing is the secret sauce for surgical success. Suture Academy has evolved over the past four years when I first conceived the idea. As an educator, I saw the struggle so many dentists were having with suturing and how frustrated they were. So I went into my garage and built the first prototype of the Z-Pad. I wanted it to represent the most common scenarios where dentists need to gain clarity in suturing. I then tested it on a group of 30 dentists and one non-dentist. We spent seven hours together on suture education. First I reviewed the laws and critical principles of suturing and then did a hands-on practice. Watching these step-by-step -step videos and practicing the techniques on the Z-Pad, within about seven hours, dentists went from zero confidence to being able to suture at a high level with confidence and clarity. Guess what? The non-dentists perform better than some of the dentists which taught me that no previous experience is required to be excellent in suturing. I then tested it over and over again on different groups, large and small, general dentists and specialists, and different levels of knowledge and expertise. The ZPET prototype was enhanced and perfected and I added a technique atlas with over 200 illustrations and created what's now become known internationally as Suture Academy. Since then, dentists going through this training have experienced increased success in surgery. How so? The key to surgical success is suturing at a top level. My goal in creating Suture Academy is to teach you exactly how high-level periodontists suture and get amazing results in implant surgery, soft tissue procedures, bone grafting, and aesthetics. The new Suture Academy that you're about to get access to has been built from the ground up based on the feedback and results of the most successful dentists and specialists updated to reflect what is working in suturing right now. Now, in the first video in the series, we explored the ability to create primary closure that is so critical for great healing. We looked at a case of excess soft tissue after extractions and how to utilize the prayer technique to create primary closure and position the tissue where you want it to be. We explored how you can use the same exact strategies yourself in your practice, no matter how experienced you are. I taught the same technique to absolute beginners with excellent results. In the same way, you get the advantage of Sutra Academy training even if you're just getting started in surgery. All you need is a system to teach you how a top surgical specialist is suturing. The system is broken down to the basic elements so you can simply follow along without the complexity and the overwhelm. 
In the second video, we went into detail on how to suture in the aesthetic zone. And I shared with you the most critical principle in suturing, flap alignment. I used the t-shirt example so you can start implementing this important principle right away, check for flap mobility, and then strategically place your sutures. I showed you the sequence of suturing and the idea behind it so you can let the system work for you right now when you encounter similar situations. In the third video, I walked through the roadmap to excelling in suturing by understanding the principles of safety, materials, and mechanics. I showed you the user experience and dentists that are using the system to master suturing. I also trained your eyes and your mind to teach you how I see and think about suturing of large flaps and guided bone regeneration. The new Suture Academy is a complete system that is meant to get you everything you need to master suturing in a short period of time. This is exactly what I envisioned for dentists like you. In the recording, you saw me train two general dentists. Their training lasted seven hours and that was enough to complete their transformation and get their suturing skills to another level. No matter where you are in your surgical journey, even if you have no experience, Suture Academy gives you all the tools and resources to make what was considered complex and overwhelming to a straightforward and logical process. We saw the results of Dr. Phil Mandelovitz, who went through Suture Academy and applies these principles in his practice as a general dentist. Lydia, a general dentist and a new mom, found the training to be refreshing and questioned, why isn't the Z-pad part of the curriculum in dental school? Dr. Jeff Rosenberg, a GP from Philadelphia, let us know how effective the training was for his surgical growth. He talked about the signature, every artist needs to leave. In his words, the signature is how you suture. I have so many more stories just like these about Suture Academy graduates who are using the techniques they learned in their practices and are seeing transformational results. In fact, one of my mentees even said to me, Ziv, I'm not sure that I'd still be performing surgery if it wasn't for what you teach and now I'm seeing success that I only dreamed about. It's no wonder why dentists are jumping at the opportunity to enroll in Suture Academy. So they too can experience a level of surgical success in their practices, achieve growth, financial security, and freedom, and create a real impact in the lives of their patients and their own family. And not in some time way out in the distant future, but right now, today. If you're one of those thousands of dentists who have watched this video series so far, you know that the way that you suture affects your surgical results. It's simple. If you suture at a high level, you get surgical success. If you don't, well, let's not go there. Mastering the suturing process makes all the difference between struggling in surgery, feeling overwhelmed at spinning your wheels and having a profitable, fast-growing surgical practice that makes a massive positive impact in the lives of your patients and your close family, creating massive growth and thereby giving you the ability to take time off when you want to, do what you love, provide a life that you've always wanted for your family and the freedom to take time off, travel, and live the type of lifestyle that most people only dream about. So here's the question. Are you ready to take that step toward your vision? Are you ready to build and grow your surgical skills and master suturing, which will give you the type of freedom and impact that you want to have? Are you ready to build your surgical foundation to have excellent surgical results and grow your practice? I know what it feels like too. From feeling overwhelmed, struggling and stuck, to having enough resources and the freedom 
to do what you want. Thousands of the doctors I mentor in Surgical Master have had that same experience. And I know it can be a reality for you too if you stick with me. Because right now, I want to show you what your path forward can look like and how Suture Academy can change the trajectory of your practice and change how you perform surgery forever. So let's dive right into who Suture Academy is for, who it's not for, and what you'll get when you join. First, let's identify who the Suture Academy training is not for. If you're the type of dentist that looks for a quick fix opportunity without putting in the effort, this is not for you. If you're not willing to work at it or you don't take surgery seriously or you're not willing to do the right thing for your patients, then you should stop watching this video right now because that's the opposite of what Suture Academy is all about. Now, if you're saying to yourself, that's not you at all, that you take surgery seriously, that you want to perform in a way that doesn't only grow and build your practice, but will also generally help patients, keep watching because Suture Academy is a critical step in doing that. When you join Suture Academy and take action, then whether you're just starting out or you're already comfortable in surgery, no matter your skill level or your future goals, you will see changes when you take action, just like the results that so many others have already seen. Suture Academy is a proven framework for mastering suturing at a high level, like a top specialist in a short period of time with clarity and confidence and without the overwhelm and confusion. Suture Academy gives you the confidence to suture in any type of surgical scenario and gives you the turnkey system to tackle these scenarios with clarity and ease. How? By giving you concise instructions, video tutorials, a technique atlas, and mentorship that is meant to keep you on track. Instead of feeling overwhelmed, lost, and guessing what to do next and how to do it, your path is laid out right there in front of you inside Sutra Academy. Sutra Academy gives you the confidence and clarity because all you need to do is follow the instructions. Use the resources I'm giving you and follow the teachings step by step. Think about it. If you know how to suture exactly like a periodontist and have the same ability to see and execute things, then you've just set yourself apart. Even if you're starting from scratch with no experience or even a practice of your own. Now, before I tell you about how Suture Academy is structured, I want to let you know that we're kicking off the training really soon. The training operates like a university course, only much shorter. We open up enrollment, everybody signs up and registers, and then we close the doors and kick things off together. The reason why I mention this is because we are about to close the doors very shortly. The window of opportunity to get in is almost closed. So if you want to take advantage of everything that I'm about to share with you and you want to get in before the door is closed, you'll need to act quickly. Now, when you join the Suture Academy, you'll get access to 50 step-by-step -step core video lessons spread over seven days. The videos are covering all aspects of suturing from the choice of materials, holding the instruments, and the mechanics of suturing. At the beginning, you'll learn how to wrap your suture material, how to twist, and how to interlock and release, and I'll also give you an overview of the must-know information in suturing, so you can immediately implement. The must-know suturing techniques are revealed in the first day, plus you'll be able to practice them on the Z-pad you'll gain the insights into how these techniques are working by using the other resources, like the technique atlas that comes with the course. By the end of the second and third days, you'll have gained tremendous insight about the main suturing techniques and what materials are recommended. I'm going to walk you through the entire process of each suturing technique step by step, including how to engage your needle in the tissue the proper way to hold your instruments for maximum efficiency and safety. 
Suturing is taught in a simple and concise way that will be clear no matter if you have previous experience or not. I'll be sharing the exact techniques, materials, tips and tricks I currently use in my Beverly Hills practice. By the end of days four and five, you'll not only know the exact suturing techniques that are indicated for each procedure, you'll have the exact strategies and techniques that I personally use when I suture, making it easy to apply in your own practice. This means that you'll be literally suturing like a periodontist or a highly trained surgeon in a short period of time. It's a transformation we haven't seen before Suture Academy. I can't stress enough just how important this stuff is and how many even experienced dentists are surprised what they discover when they go through this learning process. Once you're confident about the main suturing techniques, it's time to gain clarity about the more difficult techniques like sling suturing, suturing in the aesthetic zone, and for grafting. This is where you tap into techniques that were not very clear to the general dental community until now. In Suture Academy, I don't only teach you technique, I teach you how I see and think about things and include the mindset I have when I suture. Your surgeries and specifically suturing will feel easier with a better flow as your confidence grows. You don't have to use complex techniques to gain success in suturing. Actually, the simpler the better, and you can save yourself a lot of heartaches Audio by good? sticking to what's taught in the course. Keep it simple. Test I'll show you exactly Audio. how to do it. Test Inside Sushi Academy, Audio. days six and seven is where things start to get really juicy because you've acquired knowledge about the laws and principles of suturing, you have practice on the Z-pad, and this is where you tackle clinical cases and can start implementing in your own surgeries. When you follow the principles you learned and do this the right way, your patients will heal faster and better because your suturing is more complete. Primary closure and soft tissue stability does wonders to surgical healing. You've heard me mention before that Suture Academy graduates have gone to build their surgical skills further and keep growing all the time. Now, if there's a secret to suturing with high predictability and success, it's this. Following step-by-step step, a well-established suturing system, starting with flap alignment and choosing the right places and the right materials to engage your sutures. It's not a random process and I can save you years of frustrations by teaching you what has worked for me in the past 20 years. We'll walk through step-by-step step how to use these strategies and suturing sequences in Suture Academy. By the way, don't worry if you don't have much or any experience in surgery. I didn't have a lot of experience and knowledge even after graduating and advanced surgical training. I've learned and developed these methods in the trenches of private practice. I know what works and what doesn't. I know that not being able to suture the right way can be a stumbling block for so many dentists. So now we have a dedicated path on what and how to do things. All is covered in detail inside Suture Academy, while I personally mentor you during this training. Now, when it comes to more sophisticated and involved procedures like bone augmentation and soft tissue grafting, suturing the right way is the difference between success and failure. In Suture Academy, you'll be able to identify the best suturing options for these procedures. I'm not using traditional teaching methods that overcomplicate or confuse you. I teach you like I like to learn myself. Step by step, simple, concise, and straight to the point with no time wasted. I'll be showing you the exact techniques I'm personally using in my practice to make sure that you're getting the same results that I'm getting. Suture Academy just works. We'll also be going through how to easily handle the suturing instruments included in this training. The handling, although simple, needs to be done the right way or it will affect the suturing outcome. It's another aspect of suture training that was never tackled in the past. 
In Sutra Academy, you learn how to hold your instruments, wrap sutras around your fingers, the twisting and the direction. Hi everybody, Zeev Simon here. Welcome to this live broadcast from the Surgical Master Studio in Beverly Hills. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here on this broadcast with me. We are broadcasting this live on a few platforms on Facebook Live. We are broadcasting this on uh, YouTube. But uh, the place to watch it is on our broadcast page where you can actually ask me questions, ask me anything, communicate with me during this live training, communicate with the other doctors on this, uh, on this page. And if you're watching this on, on social media, uh, definitely share it on your page, share it in a forum, and head over to Surgical Master Live, because this is going to be a very important training on soft tissue surgery. What are the key factors that are going to make you successful in surgery? And I really isolated it, pinned it down, to soft tissue surgery and suturing because you can perform a procedures, procedure flawlessly and have great outcomes with that, but if you didn't handle the soft tissues in the right way, if you didn't suture properly, you can have this whole procedure fail. And we don't want that. We want you to be successful and prosperous. We want your practice to grow and for you to be happy and I'm happy to be here together with my friend, Dr. Rashad Ryman. Uh, we are in the Surgical Master Studio. Great to have you here, partner. Great to have you here, okay. too. Awesome. Honored. Awesome. We have uh, all the resources, the great material, uh, real material from my practice, where you'll see the importance of soft tissue handling. Don't take it lightly. You may be able to place an implant, and you may be able to harvest tissue. You may be able to perform a procedure well, but if you didn't excel in soft tissue surgery, uh, it's really all about that. So we're going to focus on the soft tissues, we're going to focus on soft, on the suturing, and anything to do with you being successful. So the live broadcast page is on Surgical Master Live. If you're watching this on Facebook, like it, share it, put it on a forum, but head over to Surgical Master Live and ask me anything that you want. The training today will include important key principles in surgery. The decision making in regards to incisions, the flap designs, the suturing, complications and their management, and also communication. You need to be able to communicate with your patient. You need to be able to communicate with your team members really important because communication is almost the key to anything, the key to success in your personal life and human relationships and the key to success in your career. So I want you to get rid of overwhelm and confusion and gain more of the clarity and the confidence that you need. So important to be confident, but not fake confidence, real confidence. And there's a method to learn that. It's a learned skill. You don't, you're not born with confidence. Babies are not just uh, getting, you know, stepping out and starting a career and starting to place implants. There's a whole process of crawling, standing up, walking, falling down, and then we develop our confidence. And I'm, I'm happy to play a role in your growth. Uh, we also opened the registration to Sutra Academy today. So to register uh, go to sutraacademy.com. You can s do it right after the broadcast. And we're already enrolling in this program where you can take your suturing skills to the next level and suture like a surgical specialist in a short period of time. And more about that uh, later on in this broadcast. So again, welcome to this broadcast. My name is Dr. Zeev Simon. I'm the creator of Surgical Master. I'm here with my friend and partner, Dr. Rashad Ryman. We are live from the Surgical Master Studio. 
some people call me the general dentist best friend. You are. And, and uh, yeah, I like and I, that that means I have a lot of friends and I love helping dentists to maximize their potential and surgery is a wonderful way to build a practice, enjoy growth and help your patients and your family and yourself and create some significance, not to do the drill and fill, the mundane things in dentistry. Surgery has all of that and I'm honored and privileged to play a role in your growth. I've been doing this for a long time, for almost 20 years. I've been practicing dentistry as a periodontist here in Beverly Hills. I've been teaching dentists from around the world, whether through the live courses in Beverly Hills or traveling or through our online platform called Surgical Master. If you're not part of our community, join us. We are the fastest growing community online uh, in regards to surgical education. We have tens of thousands of members uh, on our platforms in our live courses and uh, we're excited. We're growing real fast. Uh, join us. Uh, Again, this is a broadcast live here from Beverly Hills, uh, from the studio. Uh, it's a very important broadcast and it's important right now because, you know, soft tissues really make a big difference. Soft tissue skills make it or break it, as we say. We, we, we want to make it. We want our cases to be successful and soft tissue skills are part of it. We are in the Surgical Master Studio, so we have uh, multiple resources here. We have the whiteboard, we have our screen, uh, my laptop, we have our chat, bo chat board here so we can answer the questions as they uh, come out live. We're going to make it very interactive. Feel free to ask as many questions as you want. It doesn't cost you anything. This is a free Q &A. training, free Q&A on soft tissue surgery and suturing and you're here to learn. You could have done things that are, you know, maybe more fun to you but you decided to spend the time with us and grow your skills and grow your potential to be successful. Now, dentists want to be successful and every dentist wants to do a surgical procedure and wants to excel and wants to get in there and do your graft and do your implant and your periosurgery. But in reality, a lot of dentists are struggling with what comes before the surgery and what comes after the surgery. And, and more specifically, many dentists are struggling with incisions and flap designs, period. That's really the beginning of every surgical procedure. And many dentists are struggling with suturing. Now, if you don't have the beginning and the end, you will not be successful. And it's not enough for you to just drill a hole and place some titanium. You need to figure out many things before that. And this is really the purpose of this, this broadcast. And let's re get right to it. So again, we are live here from the Surgical Master Studio. Feel free to leave any questions on Surgical Master Live. If you're watching this on Facebook, that's cool. You can keep doing this, but ideally share it on your page, share it on a forum and head over to Surgical Master Live where we are going to be teaching you real life cases and what, to, what you need to do. And starting with the simple cases where you are placing an implant in the posterior mandible in a first molar position and you have the bone but you may not have enough tissue. And basically a question that comes to mind is how much attached tissue do you need for health? Okay, so the more the better. But let's give it some more numbers. So I look at the, at the minimum of attaching keratinized tissue being two to three millimeters. And a lot of us like to go the flapless route. That's totally fine, but when you punch the tissue, what are you getting rid of? You're getting rid of the a big chunk of good attaching keratinized tissue. If you're placing a wide body implant, the radius, oh I'm sorry, the, the diameter the diameter of this punch is going to be five millimeters. You will be wasting millimeters of good soft tissue. So the majority of all cases in the posterior mandible are actually not appropriate for a punch technique. And the incision design that I typically do is a mid crestal incision and then I reflect a full thickness flap, completely expose the bony architecture 
and then create what I call a half punch, and we call it the half punch technique, and that's really the more of the bread and butter of the posterior mandible. Now, sometimes that's not even enough. You can't even do that, but for most cases, it works real well. And what are the advantages? Number one, you are preserving the attaching keratinized tissue to the buckle of the healing abutment, the implant, and later on the restoration. And good tissue, we know, is critical in sustaining a, the health of the implant long term. Number two, you don't have to reflect the lingual flap. What an advantage. You simply punch, uh, half punch it, and when you placed your implant, some of uh, the doctors are concerned, how am I going to close the flap? What is, you know, is going to happen with these gaps? Well, don't forget that a flap and soft tissues are not a piece of cardboard. They're not very stiff. They can very easily conform around a healing abutment or a custom abutment or a provisional restoration. So when you suture this soft tissue, as long as you made the right incision in the right location, can actually create primary closure. So I don't want you to feel that when you are preserving the tissue, you'll have problems with suturing later on, or you want to rush the procedure and you want to place a, an implant immediately and you have to use a punch technique, okay? So punch technique is great when you have a lot of tissue. In the posterior mandible, not a whole lot. So many times, you'll make the incision on the crest, more to the lingual, half punch the lingual aspect, expose the bone, place your implant, and later on, suture around the healing abutment. Very, very simple. If you can just pick up one tip from this training today, <laughs> I'll be happy I'll, I can sleep at night. But we have a lot more coming. Okay, very, very simple to do. So this is simple, right? Yeah, and, and it's two interrupted sutures, basically, on the mesial and the distal of the implant. Yeah, totally, yeah, simple. And sometimes when you have the palatal tissue is a little bit more rigid, so it doesn't conform as well, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that, that too. But even if there's a tiny little gap in the inter-implant inter area, that will heal up in, in secondary intention healing. Mm -hmm. So my point being, if you know these simple soft tissue skills, if you know how to make simple incisions and know exactly where to divide the flap and why, that is going to help you with the more complex procedures, when you have to do a s more complicated extraction, when you have to deal with a large bony defect or dehiscence or fenestration, that, that's going to be extremely helpful to you because you have common sense and you have some thought process that helps you make those decisions. That, that's really the purpose of this, this training. I want to give you some practical tools and answer your questions about those decisions. So let's start with this case. The patient came in uh, right away and had a large abscess on the buckle in between two teeth. I took a radiograph. Well, which one is it? Is it the implant or is it the premolar? Well, we can easily trace the infection and we can find that the premolar, the uh, uh, premolar tooth uh, was cracked and needed to be removed. So that's actually very simple in, extraction and if you think about it anytime you see a large infection encompassing the whole tooth the extraction is very simple but the bone grafting is going to be a lot more difficult because there's more bone loss so first tip of tonight don't wait for these abscesses to occur once you detected the crack or you have a suspicion act upon it because the longer you wait the larger the infection the more bone loss the easier the extraction, but the more difficult the regeneration. The more the destruction. The more destruction. Don't wait. Okay, get those teeth out of there. And this tooth is obviously uh, cracked. Nice crack. Very nice. Okay, so bacteria from the oral cavity travel along the crack, infect the bone, and then this infection finds the path of least resistance, and you have a large abscess. So the question now is, the extra extraction was very simple. Anytime you see an abscess, you can assume there's a large bony defect. The question is, how do you handle it? We know that we need to clean out the infection. We know, th we know that we need to do some element of bone grafting. And my preference for some of these cases is if I have a large infection and I'm not sure that I can reach it from within the socket, I'm going to reflect the full thickness flap. What's the complicating factor? Number one, we have an adjacent implant. 
we probably don't want to involve an implant and expose it to the oral cavity, number one. Second consideration is you have a sinus tract. We have a, technically a perforation in the tissue. How are you going to handle that? How, we, how, how can we make sure that the, this perforation doesn't get bigger and bigger and we worsen it or the tissue tears? Well, here are the two tips. Stay away from the tear and stay away from the implant surface. It's kind of giving you a general guideline in terms of your flap design. So if I had to design this flap, I would engage the intracellular area of both adjacent teeth, but I would create a vertical releasing incision on the mesiobuccal aspect of the implant. Okay, so in, in, in my thought process is I'll stay away from the perforation, I'll stay as best as I can from the implant, and reflect the full thickness flap. So let's see what's hiding underneath. Okay, so we have a large fenestration. Okay, we preserved the ridge of bone. Okay, the ridge of bone is still there, right here. But I did not know that this implant had a fenestration itself. Whether it developed over time or the implant perforated in the first place, who knows? This is an old implant. But the reality is that my decision making had a good sound rationale, but it proved to be the wrong idea because it so happens that the vertical releasing incision is right on top of the surface of the implant. That's bad. Because what happens, that's exactly where I'll have to suture. There's no way to fix it anymore. We have to suture it up and we have to hope that this incision line is not going to open up. Okay, so that's one thing. So what are we learning from that is that you can have all the plans in the world and have the rationale, but really what happens in the surgery, we have to tackle and we have to address that. So in terms of grafting, and now I'm not going to, when I, when I see this during a surgery, I'm not going to start dwelling about this and I'm going to start getting upset or, no, I'm going to be very methodical and pragmatic about, okay, I have, I have a job to do. I have to graft this defect. I have to handle the situation. And when you have a dehiscence, I'm sorry, if you have a fenestration defect, the condensation of bone, regardless of the material, is done both from the occlusal surface and the buccal. Okay? Both. Because this way you make sure that the condensation is even. Of course, if you're going to place a lot of pressure occlusally, the bone graft is just going to come out the buccal. So it has to make, has to make sense. Uh, and again, once you have a, a, a fenestration defect, you want to have some type of containment mechanism, whether it's a PRF mem membrane or a collagen membrane. That's totally your choice, but you need to have something to contain it. And I place the PRF membrane and also on the exposed uh, surface of the implant and suture it up. Okay? Uh, and, and, you know, in terms of suturing, there is a rationale for that as, as well. And in our training upcoming for this broadcast, the first principle of suturing is flap alignment. You want things to align, like our t-shirt example. Mm -hmm. We want flaps to align. If I'm going to start suturing the vertical, I may end up short on the occlusal part of the socket. If I just focus on the occlusal part, the vertical may not be able to close, and that's a problem because we have an exposed implant in there. So in terms of alignment, these are the three sutures and there's two sutures that we do first. Close up the occlusal surface just to align the flap, and then place one, vertical, one in the vertical, more closer to the coronal part, so I know that the flap is aligned. So I already know that anywhere that I place my sutures, I have some pretty good alignment of the flap, because alignment is critical. If you don't align properly, you'll have gaps and openings that lead to infection, that lead to failures. And then I can alternate between the vertical and the occlusal surface. And my primary goal right now, once I align the flap, is to suture the attached tissue. And in a way, you can look at it like alignment. Why the attached tissue? Because that's the type of tissue that is pretty sensitive if it stays open. It scars if you don't close it up. It tends to open up if you don't suture it properly. It tends to tear because it's not as elastic as the mucosa. So I would focus more on the keratinized and attached tissue, then go back to the occlusal surface, make sure that I have an X suture and something there to hold my membrane, and only then focus on the vertical in the mucosa. So you have a sequence of seven steps 
or sequence of seven sutures with the proper sequence because we want to make sure that we su when we suture, we don't want to suture randomly. And that's what I find a lot of dentists are, are doing. And that, that also came out in the survey. We had hundreds of dentists answer this, answering the survey telling me about their suture problems and being very honest. Telling me, you know, Ziv, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I know, I know how to place a knot, but I don't know where to place it. I don't know which suture material. I don't know which instruments. I can't even, my hands are quivering. I learned a new word. My hands are quivering when I place sutures. So we're going to answer these questions. There's no clarity in the mind, but uh, this is a great strategy. So you, you distribute sort of the tension when you do, do it that way, yeah? Exactly, because if you have a, f a small flap or a large flap, and you focus on one end, what's going to happen to the other one? It pulls away. It pulls away, it's going to open up, open up and you, you won't be able to close it. So this is the strategy for this technique. And, and in spite of the patient having very poor oral hygiene, I mean, she pretty much was scared to brush, and she developed calculus in a week, it healed pretty well. Wow, it, he it healed well. Why? Because, not because I did something complicated or fancy. That was, by the way, one of the other questions in the sur survey. One of the dentists asked me, I don't know the fancy techniques. I want to learn fancy techniques. So there's nothing fancy about it. These are simple interrupted sutures, but it's about flap alignment and the sequence of the, the interrupted sutures. And the strategy by which you made this incision was very smart. You did it on the distal. You could have done one mesial, one distal. There's so many ways, or you could have done it on the mesial but you wanted to move the scar line as far back as possible. Is that, is that your thought process as a specialist going into doing something like this? The, the, the less verticals, the better. Mm -hmm. The less vertical incisions, the better. Verticals are a necessary evil sometimes. We need to make them, for, like in this example, and, and other examples that you'll see in the broadcast. But the farther away from the aesthetic zone, so the less, the better, and farther away from the aesthetic zone. So mm -hmm. that was the thought process. So this site healed uh, quite well. Oral hygiene is not 100%, still some inflammation, but a real good bone from a volume perspective. We take this case and we take a CT scan, we plan it virtually on a software. And then we have, again, a dilemma, how to tackle it surgically. Do we reflect the flap? Do we do, do, we do it flapless? Well, think about the initial example I gave you at the beginning. If you can preserve most of or all of the attaching keratinized tissue, the better it would be. Don't be scared to reflect the full thickness flap. A lot of doctors are scared of making incisions and reflecting sutures and uh, reflecting flaps and suturing. So what are they doing? They're going flapless. And there's room for flapless, but many times a flap, a flap is more advantageous from a soft tissue perspective. So reflect the full thickness flap, the implant is placed fully guided into the proper restorative position, good torque values. I needed to do some additional grafting on the surface. I always confirm the position of the implant. I take my verification periapical x-rays. No compromise and place it in the good position. Okay, pretty narrow space by the way. Yeah. Pretty narrow space. And the patient healed quite well until two weeks. Now this is all real from my own practice. Two weeks later, Patient comes in, we have a routine follow-up procedure a week later, two weeks later, four weeks, and two months. At two weeks, I noticed some swelling. I took a radiograph, and it doesn't look as great. It doesn't look as good as it looked like at placement. At this point, it's only fair to assume this implant is not going to make it. In spite of me making the right decisions or what I thought was right, instead of, in, in spite of placing implants in the right position, computer guided. At two weeks, I already know this implant is not going to make it and I'll have to remove it. So here's our first complication of tonight and a first message. Complications will happen to you no matter what. You can do everything by the book, follow all the protocols, keep sterile technique, be meticulous with your soft tissues. But we're dealing with biology, and every patient is different. And when you place enough implants, you'll have enough implants that will not take, will not integrate. And it's important to know what to do with these situations. And we know that we need to remove the implant. And, and we'll talk about 
how to communicate with the patient. And, and, and the, one of the things that I tell patients when this happens is it's a temporary setback. Don't, don't, a lot of doctors get into a damaging cycle, which we call it a vicious cycle. We actually talked about it in, in last month's uh, broadcast. And they get into a thought process where they think about why did it fail? I did something wrong. They start to feel fear, anxiety. They don't have the clarity on, on what to do and how to communicate with, communicate with the patient. And I gave you some techniques and some verbal verbiage or verbal skills on how to communicate with your patients. And one of the things that I say, it's a temporary setback. This is what we need to do. This implant needs to be removed. We need to obviously regraft it and we need to start from scratch, but it's a temporary setback. Now, the worst thing a dentist can say is, I don't know what happened. I don't know why it failed. And, that, and that's the worst thing because you do know what happened. You, you do know that implants can fail and they can fail for three main reasons. They can get infected, they can get over torqued, okay, over torque is a big reason for implants failing, or you just placed your implant into encapsulated bone graft, and, and that happens as well. And what happens in these situations, especially if you chose a short implant and the whole implant is fully in unhealed bone graft or encapsulated graft, it will just introduce infection and it will just be expelled or removed. So my advice to you is if you are placing implants in a site that was pretty infected, make sure that your implants are a little bit long or longer so they engage the native bone that provides real stability, not fake stability. Because when I placed the implant, I had great torque values or appropriate torque values and the implant did fail. But I believe this implant was a little bit short and this implant coming out, seeing the bone graft material around it is pretty much an indication that this bone graft was mostly encapsulated and got infected on top of it. Don't get discouraged. Have a proactive mindset. Think about overcoming this obstacle. Don't let your mind drift and think about, oh my God, what have I done wrong? Uh, you know, all, all, the, all your thoughts will get represented in how you talk. You're going to lose your confidence. You're going to lose your composure. You're not going to be calm. And guess what? Your patients will get it. And your patient will lose their confidence in you. Okay, so confidence is important and confidence comes from clarity and from practice and understanding what can go wrong, having a thought process and knowing what to do. And this is really my philosophy when it comes to teaching. I'm not just going to teach you the step by step, although, although I, I do that too. But I'm going to show you the way I see things, the way I think about things, and the way I do things. So it's like the I-mind training that we focus on in our training. So the mindset right now is overcome this obstacle, graft the site with a bone graft, and in immediate failures, I don't place an immediate implant. Or in general, when an implant fails, don't stick an implant right in there. And I'm not saying it's not possible, and we see this in lectures all the time. Put a wider one in, put a, a longer one, one in, put a different one in. When an implant fails, something's wrong. Something's wrong with the healing or there was some problem with the system. It's better to hold back, graft the site and come back later on. Also, what are you going to say when the second implant fails again at the same time? Why did you place an implant in, into an infected site? So wait at least three months uh, with implants that fail I'm a little bit more proactive before the, before the next surgery. I ask the patient to come in for a cleaning a week before the procedure. You can maybe do it at no charge. That's totally up to you. Or charge for it. Why not? Build it into the procedure. Make sure that the mouth is decontaminated. Uh, give some oral hygiene instructions. Give the patient some systemic antibiotics starting two days before the next attempt. Why? Because we want to be proactive. If the, implant, the first implant got infected, Let's do things a little bit differently. Get a cleaning done, get the hygiene better, and this patient didn't have good hygiene as we saw. Uh, get the patient on antibiotics two days before. As an example, I, I placed him on Augmentin, 875 twice a day, or Clindamycin 154 times a day if they are, uh, if they are allergic to penicillin. And I pay extra, t extra attention to high torquing. High torquing is a big reason for failure. I don't immediately load them. I, closely monitor them 
to make sure that my second attempt has a better chance for success. Okay, so I'm not, not necessarily going to do anything different in terms of my placement. My placement is my placement. It's computer guided. It's where I want the implant to be. And it's restoratively driven. And I'm going to deliver the implant fully guided into the, into the site. But I'm going to take some additional precautions that I just mentioned to you before. So uh, what to do with the soft tissue? Here's, here's the second implant placement about three months later. Uh, I, I made my incision more to the crest to the palate. So I am able to preserve uh, a great amount of soft tissue. Sometimes it's too much. Now, don't go overboard. Man, many dentists make the incision on the middle of the palate and, and, and mobilize all this tissue. It's not necessary because you'll have, you leave a ga gap on the palate, number one. Number two, you'll have so much tissue in the buckle that you won't be able to close it. So we have a little bit too much here. Don't take this tissue and throw it in the garbage. Okay, we take our x-ray, everything looks good. Don't take this tissue and excise it and discard of it. You can make a semicircular incision in the tissue and then mobilize it into the inter-implant tooth area. It's relatively simple to do, especially if the tissue is relatively thick. Use a brand new blade, number 15. Make the incision on the buccal tissue. Leave it attached. Don't go all the way or, or you'll detach it. And simply rotate it into the interproximal area. Okay, pretty simple. I okay. love this technique. Okay, it's a simple technique. It's been around for years and years and years. Uh, Palachi technique. Utilize it, okay? It's not just in theory and it's simple to do. The distal, the, the, uh, the other side is going to heal uh, with secondary intention healing. Okay. How do we close up a, a, a flap like this? You know, a lot of dentists are getting overwhelmed. Okay, oh my God, how am I going to close it up? Well, if you just rotated the tissue into the interproximal area, that's a weak spot. That's a part that can always push its way out. So that's where I would start focusing on flap alignment. So sutures one, two, three are basically for flap alignment. Okay, we want to make sure that it's closed primarily. I have a little bit of an overlap on top of the healing abutment, but with time, this tissue is going to fill in uh, where it's really important on the mesial, bordering the canine. And really this case shows that in spite of obstacles, in spite of infection, in spite of you losing, me losing an implant, and needing to redo the case and exposing the implant surface at the beginning when I did the extraction, these obstacles can be overcome. So the more you overcome, the better you'll become. No doubt about it, okay? The greatest achievement in life, the greatest achievement in this world came through struggle. Look at how countries were built. This beautiful country was, was started as a struggle and we're still struggling and, and getting better. Same thing in surgery. Don't fear those obstacles. Obstacle is really the way. It's, it's, it's the name of a book. The obstacle is the way. Read it. Because it'll teach you that the more you have, the more you overcome, the better you'll become. Okay? Remember that. And then you're ready for more difficult cases. Cases in the aesthetic zone. Patients are coming in with cracked teeth, with resorption, with big infections. And you, you see what's going to happen to you when you start mastering the basics and start having eye and mind training and you start seeing things like a specialist and you're thinking like a specialist and you are a good specialist and you are not just working like a robot or a technician you can do amazing things but take your time okay so this patient came to see me a couple years back uh, I suspected this tooth have, had a resorption but we didn't have clear evidence. There was always a, an inflammation. I actually sent the patient to an orthodontist that did some orthodontic treatment, but this inflammation persisted and so did the resorption. The resorption actually continued and got worse and worse compared to the baseline. This tooth needed to be extracted and that's really something that you see even as a surgical specialist speci specializing in implant surgery. I'm board certified and I've been doing this for 20 years. When a patient is referred to me for an extraction and an implant, I don't automatically extract the tooth. I want to find 
a good reason, I want to find a good rationale and good options for this patient to have a great outcome. And I wanted to have the tooth in the right position when I extract it, maybe gain a little bit more bone and soft tissue. The tricky part is that I saw the CT scan following the ortho and this tooth actually was moved to the buckle with a fenestration that was created. And as you see, it's not necessarily a bad thing and I'm seeing more and more doctors, uh, actually internationally, not so much in the United States, moving teeth not just vertically for extraction and creating more soft tissue and bone, but moving teeth buccally to create more bone and, and heftier, bigger ridges, which is really something that we all dream about. And I wanted to share this case with you. But I know this is going to be a challenge. Why? The tooth is buccally positioned. There's no doubt there is a dehiscence, definitely the apex. But the hope is that I have a thin layer of bone on the buccal. In, in order not to lose it, I'd like to use the socket shielding technique that is so popular now. It's prescribed and described as a simple no-brainer procedure. It's n it, it, is a br it is a big deal and it is a brainer procedure. You, you have to know what you're doing. You had an experience with a socket shield. You think it's a no-brainer until you attempt it and then you realize it's a different ball game. It's a, it's a, it's a different ball game. It's a, <laughs> okay? not, not to say it's impossible. Not to say it's impossible. It's very possible. But again, it's going to be an obstacle at the beginning that you'll overcome. And, and, and the better you'll become. And you'll yeah. do more and more and more. So luckily, I already have quite a bit of experience with socket shielding. So I know the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, I, and, I, and, I, and we'll see some of it in this, in this case. So uh, some of these socket shields are quite complicated because you don't really see where the apex is if you don't have a CT scan. Now, I had a CT scan, and I saw that the apex is, is outside the bone. So really, to do a socket shield for a case like that, you have to reflect the flap mm -hmm. because I'll have to remove. You see, there's a, there's a whole dehiscence, and maybe some of it caused by me with my birth, I, and I'm not sure about that. But you see, the apex is outside the bone, right in here. This part of the root that is fully exposed is not supporting any bone. There's no point in, in leaving it. So I'm going to take this part of the exposed root and remove it. And, and now I have great access. I can very easily cut it away and look at it as if it's a, just a dehiscence, a, sh a thin dehiscence that is very easy to regenerate. So this is not a case for an immediate placement. There's a huge socket in there. There's some question marks about the buccal plate. We're using a socket shield to preserve it, but you see something that you don't see in nature. What are you seeing? <laughs> it's about two, three millimeters outside compared to the adjacent teeth. And, and there's a layer of bone over it, huh? There's a, a thin layer of bone, and the socket shield is, at least what I intended to do, is what's going to preserve it. Very courageous. Very minimal. Courageous on, on my part? Yeah. Well, you see, I, it would be... The service, not to try it? It's worth trying this because if you get rid of this shield, you get rid of the bone. Remember, when the tooth is lost, the bone is lost, and the gum is lost. Mm -hmm. So that's just the, the principle of life, the principle of nature. If you can preserve some of the shield, um, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy, we have some challenges here, you got a chance. But once you do it, it's a, a relatively simple defect to regenerate with uh, bone graft, with PRF, a collagen membrane, simply the compartment technique. Okay? Basically, you take a, a rigid collagen membrane, or semi-rigid, that will act as a containment mechanism. I like to add PRF layers of a PRF membrane that drape from the buccal plate all the way to the occlusal part of the surface occlusal part of the socket and close it. It doesn't have to be closed primarily. So in terms of suturing, a lot of you would look at it and would say, wow, that's pretty good suturing, pretty nice and tight and well aligned. Remember, flap alignment is the key. So this is basically a combination of simple interrupted sutures and a figure eight. So the first thing that I'm going to do is place 
my suture on the vertical releasing incision. Why? Because if I start on the mesial, I may create some tension and steal, literally steal away some tissue. Once I get to the vertical, we'll have a gap. And then we have to start from scratch. So that's the weakest point right there. And it that's the, the most important point to secure. It's the corner. It's the critical point for alignment. Mm -hmm. It's Remember the shirt, OK? We're we aligning the shirt. It's the critical point of alignment uh, because it, it starts a vertical. And then I'm going to align the other side mm -hmm. and one in the middle. And then I'm good. It's, it's already well aligned. That's the principle of alignment. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. And then attach gingiva, and then OK, I, I, I placed one X suture just to make sure that my membrane doesn't run away. OK. Right on top. And then I'm going to the attached tissue. You paid attention to the lecture. I did. OK, <laughs> you followed. It's that, it's that easy. I mean, you, you make it very clear. And that numbering is very, because I, I, historically, I've had confusion. You have a big flap. You're like, OK, I guess I can start it. But when you, when you go in and you have a game plan, it's, it's, uh, you have more confidence, I feel. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Clarity, confidence, and it e as easy as one, two, three, yeah. or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. nine, ten. Okay, <laughs> ten sutures. I know it's a lot. It sounds like a lot of sutures, but really, they're all simple, interrupted. And in reality, there are different suture material that you, materials that you can use. I prefer to use gut sutures. So for the occlusal part, I would probably use gut 40 for sutures one, two, three, four and later on uh, uh, six, uh, I'm sorry, seven. But for the vertical releasing incision, I'm going to go to a 5-0. I'm going to go a little bit smaller because very often those vertical releasing incisions, if you get a, t a cutout or a tear, then it really messes up this part of the flap. So you want to use a very small needle. And, and we talk about it in our advanced suture training. In Suture Academy, how to prevent cutouts. One of the examples of vertical releasing incisions. Okay, so you have the whole sequence of the 10 sutures. So if you have thick tissue, you go to a 3-0. If it's friable, thin tissue, you go with a 5-0. Is that a good uh, okay. baseline? The, the, the baseline is limit the number of sutures to the minimum or the type of sutures. So for gut, I only use two types of gut sutures, 4-0 and 5-0. So 3-0 we don't use, Okay. not necessary. 4-0 is 90% of all cases. 3-0, I'm sorry, 5-0, <laughs> you put it in my brain. 5-0 <laughs> is for more delicate tissues, like the aesthetic zone, like vertical releasing incisions. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanted to use proline sutures, like the previous case, totally fine, 6-0, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you have to remove them, OK? Mm -hmm. So simp simple enough. Now, from an occlusal point of view, you see it a little bit differently here. But mm -hmm. it's the same principle. 1, 2, 3, 4 are more for alignment. Then you suture the vertical come back to the occlusal part, add another X or two Xs, and then finish up your vertical. And you have great healing. Wow. Again, not because I sutured in a fancy way. You don't have to be fancy. But it's going to heal real well. This is a week after. There's not a whole lot of inflammation. You can leave the sutures in place. You can remove them. Give the patient some oral hygiene instructions. Give him a soft brush. Give him an end tufted brush to clean the extraction socket. This is going to heal real fast. This patient is going to have a bonded restoration. And this is something that we don't see. Oh, di I'm sorry, we didn't see before, before socket shielding. Look at the buccal tissue. It looks like the tooth is still there. Wow. You see the stippling? Yeah, the okay. orange peel. Orange peel, stippling. Why? Because the tooth technically is still there, just the shield. Is the body uh, like tricked into thinking the tooth is still there? Is that the reaction that happens? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, yeah, I say, you know, we are fooling the body and thinking the tooth is still there because there's a PDL that is vital and has mm -hmm. blood supply and nerve supply. We're fooling not the, the body, we're fooling the buccal plate. Mm -hmm. The buccal plate will resorb once the PDL is gone, it will shrink. And that's a way to prevent it. It's not foolproof. It doesn't work 100% in all cases. We have to you know, work on transparency and truth in education, Rashad, Absolutely. because and everybody watching this training, and, 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 and everybody knows that I show my cases good and bad in broadcasts on Facebook and in our teachings. Because if I'm just going to show you the successful cases, you'll get the wrong idea. It's important to know what happens in reality. And in reality, not all socket shields work well. Number one, it's technique sensitive. You've got to get 
through a learning curve. Number two, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the shield loosens up. Sometimes you damage it. Even in the hands of an uh, experienced person like even in Even in my, in my hands. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's a great service because, you know, for beginners, you, you see people posting successful cases, so you get scared. But everyone goes through a learning curve, and yeah. I think having a mentor is, is uh, a key to that. Absolutely. So, listen, this is the, this is the ridge, and here's what's, what's so cool about it. You know, we planned the case guided, <laughs> but you see the socket shield peeking through in the scan. It's there. Mm -hmm. I, lo I, lo I love the shield, okay? The shield is shielding our socket. Now the question is, okay, we preserved the ridge, we got our, our shield, okay? It's shielding the socket. What's the flap approach? I mean, it would be such a shame, don't you feel, to, to rip, that apart. rip this apart, open it up, and maybe get it infected or not. So uh, I'm not married to the idea, but really, when you have tissue under a pontic, it's always going to be inflamed. There's, it's really not a type of tissue, now or later, that is going to be amenable, amenable to be moved to the buckle. It's not a type of tissue where you can palachi. So can I say, th this is ideal for uh, a punch. A punch, or, f or flapless approach, mm -hmm. 100%. Especially since you have a whole lot of tissue, and, and, and it's not that common, but we have an open mind. How easy is it to create a circular incision or use a punch through your guide, create your osteotomy, take your VPA, verification PA, even if it's all guided. Don't be overconfident. Don't, you know, forget about the basics. Confirm you have the right trajectory. Place your implant fully guided in the right position, prosthetically in the right depth. Three and a half millimeters subgingival. You got tons of tissue, you got tons of bone. I actually placed a narrow abutment uh, per the dentist's request, uh, Dr. Phil Mandelovich, who is watching us. Speedy recovery, by the way, if you're watching us now. I uh, hope you're feeling better, my friend. Uh, this is your patient. You asked me to place a narrow abutment. Why? Because you want more tissue, and you want to have the opportunity to mold the tissue later on with your provisional. Why not? Now, if you prefer to place a wider abutment to make it easier, more power to you, and not, it's not a mistake. Everybody has their preferences, but the key message here is we can preserve this tissue, we can, can preserve this bone, and there's a time and a place for everything. There's a time to flap, and there's a time to punch, or not to flap. Okay, so if you're in a dilemma, create some clarity in your mind. I hope this broadcast is helping you in identifying some of the concepts, but also the rationale why sometimes we flap, sometimes we do a punch. Okay, so if you're watching us live now on YouTube or on Facebook Live, uh, share the feed on your Facebook page, like it, share it in a forum, but head over to Surgical Master Live where you can ask me all the questions. Any questions? Yeah, we got a, a question from guest number 4257. I see that, but can I know what Oh no, <laughs> reading the, uh, got a good question actually. You see, so the key, the key is there's a time to flap, there's a time to punch. Okay. Look for clues, look for clues, look at the tissue. The tissue is talking to you. That's the tissue is telling you something and you, and you, got to the right answer, even you, you never saw this case before. And this is all real, by the way, you never saw this presentation. No, I never did. And that's uh, it's just by being uh, mentored by you and by really immersing myself in surgery. I love surgery and, uh, you know, I... I and so here's a question. By the way, we own the website ilovesurgery.com. Yeah? Coming soon. That's awesome. ilovesurgery.com. Don't go there yet because there's, there's nothing there. Foreshadowing here. So uh, I understand that CT grafts can create root coverage but is a CT graft as effective as a free gingival graft for increasing the zone of keratinized gingiva? If so, what are the indications and contraindications for each? Great question, guest number 9627. Excellent. Try to put your name always when you ask a question just so, so we, we, can we can refer to you and, yeah. and give you the love back. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Uh, and the question is, is it for an implant or for a tooth? But let's say you're referring probably to an implant site. The, in the aesthetic zone, you don't want to place free gingival grafts. 
Okay, and I'm going to show you the, you know, actually a case like that in, in a few minutes. But to increase the zone of attaching keratinized tissue, very commonly in the posterior mandible. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I said, look, look for clues. Okay, if you're going to take a large segment where you're about to place implants and you'll use a connective tissue graft, yes, technically you could, but a free gingival graft works so much better, so much more predictable in increasing the zone of attaching keratinized tissue. Okay, so my preference is a free gingival graft. Connective tissue graft is more for increasing thickness in the aesthetic zone, more for creating more of a better emer emergence profile. And if you already have attached gingival. If you already have attached. Okay. And that was Jack Binder. Jack Binder. Jack, how are you? Dr. Binder. Dr. Binder. Happy holidays. Uh, another question was, what are the reasons this implant failed? That's guest number 4257. He was referring to that first uh, sure. implant. I, I told him I, I don't think the bone was, it was sclerotic. I don't think it was vascularized bone, but it's hard to know. And then I'd, I, we'd like to see what your thoughts sure, are. Sure, sure. And, and uh, like I mentioned before, th there are only a couple reasons where it could be. It could have been an infection, very likely. The patient is prone to infection. The patient has poor or oral hygiene. It could have been over-torquing, although I don't think so because I, I pay very close attention to the torque. If I see that I'm about to over-torque an implant, I'll reverse it and tap it mm -hmm. or, or over-prepare it. Or, which is also likely, the implant was rather short and was mostly in bone graft material. And there's a very good chance this bone graft material was encapsulated. So bone graft material that is encapsulated can stay there forever. It just stays there. It's encapsulated. It's like a little cyst. Now you place an implant, you disturb, you introduce a path of infection from the oral cavity, it goes pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you just don't know what What's the real reason for that? But it's really one of the three. Did you do anything different on the second time you took it out and bone grafted it? Or was it just the same material of bone graft, same technique? No, it was a different bone graft. The first bone graft was a dentin graft because I had the, the natural tooth. The second one is an allograft, but I don't believe it has anything to do with the tapo graft. Got it. But I took more precautions when I placed the implant. Got it. Okay. So going to the, uh, and, and that was a great segue to soft tissue grafting. Dr. Uh, Dr. Binder asked about the free gingival graft versus the connective tissue graft. Well, for the posterior mandible, very often you'll see that the keratinized tissue is limited or zero. And the mucogingival junction is pretty much on top of the ridge. In the same way we place free gingival grafts around teeth, we can graft an implant site. And the principle is the same, the graft heals the same, the incision outlines are, are the same, so follow the principles of a free gingival graft and just apply the, those principles for an implant site. And, and the way I would do it, I would make a split thickness incision following the mucogingival junction. Exactly, just follow the mucogingival junction and curve it around the, uh, the premolar and then apically reposition the flap in split thickness. That's something that you showed in a, in a live video just last week. Yeah. You did it real well. You had some struggles. You didn't create a pouch. The key here is to stay in split thickness, not to create a pouch, but also pull on the mucosa. Pull on it. I mean, not, not moving it, but pull it steadily. So as you make your incision, the tissue is going to open up and exposing the vascular bed, the blood supply, the periosteum, which is really why this graft works really well. Something you told me uh, in my technique with this is the, the way to, to point the blade. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, you you want to be perpendicular to the... It's almost perpendicular, almost perpendicular. And you blade. And you almost repeat those incisions multiple times. Mm -hmm. Multiple times as the tissue opens up. And then the question becomes, how to suture, mm -hmm. right? We know how to manage soft tissues. We know how to reflect the flap and make it in split thickness. Not a, th this type of flap, and I don't focus on speed, takes a few seconds. You've done this. It takes a few seconds to get it to get displaced. Suturing is a different question. What do you do? What's the strategy here? Strategy. The strategy is I want to create something that looks like a smiley face. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you think about a smiley face, okay, let's see if we can get this board going here. Okay. Can I might take myself down? 
So leave us your questions below and we will get to them. It's really good when we have interactions because that's how we all grow. Okay. So the vascular bed has to be in a smiley face. So if you want to keep this guy down, what would be, just intuitively thinking, Rashad, mm -hmm. what would be the first place to put a suture? If you want to keep it really down and have the same face. I would put in the middle. Okay, so this is number one. Mm -hmm. And then I would maybe work my way like that. Okay, so here is a principle called split the difference. Split the one T. The difference. What does it mean split the difference? You now split it in half. I see. Now you take both edges of the flap, you're going to split it in half. So this is two, this is three, split it in half. This is so valuable. Now it's clear. Hold on. Uh -huh. Can you still split it? Now yes. split it in half. Yep. Four, five, six, seven. Awesome. Split the difference. Okay? Very, very simple. Common sense. Uh, and I'm not saying everything in surgery is intuitive. It's not. Sometimes your intuition takes you to a uh, disaster. But this type of suturing uh, with this principle is split the difference. One in the middle. And, and the, the pi how do you pick your suture material for this? Do you okay. do a foro or a fibro and gut? or? Mm. Great question. Mm. For, this, for this type of suture, because you don't want to go back in there, I use gut. Mm -hmm. I use gut, su gut sutures and I typically use a 5-0 gut because gut. I typically engage the flap first mm -hmm. and then I engage the periosteum. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do it the other way around mm -hmm. and it's also a small, relatively small needle. So I have to hold the flap down, place the suture right in between, number one, split the difference, then split the difference again. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how you suture it. And then you get almost a smiley face. And then you mentioned something about a T-suture yes. for that. Okay, so what is a T-suture? Let's try to explain that. Sometimes you try to engage this flap and it rips, or you place your needle and it disappears under the flap, especially at the beginning. And you kind of struggle with that. So what do you do? You engage the flap first, you take the needle out, and then you take the needle and grab underneath the flap. So what, why do they call it, why is it a T? You engage, you engage the flap first, mm -hmm. you take it out, and then you take the needle and engage from the side, like this. You swipe. You swipe, and then it becomes a T, mm -hmm. a T suture. And then while you're doing that, you push down to get as much exposure of the bed as possible, because it tends to lift up. I've yes, but it, exactly, but if you do one, and split the difference initially, and these are stable, it's the perfect. rest is pretty, pretty straightforward. Oh, that's awesome. Okay? And that's it. So that's, that's how you suture it. Uh, displace it apically. And I, just a, a humbling story about the T-suture. Okay? I just, I'm, I'm showing you with full confidence the T-suture, this and that. Right? And it's like as if I've been doing this for 50 years. But the reality is I learned it about five years ago. And I learned it from a newly graduated periodontist. And this periodontist, and I, uh, Dr. Terme, uh, Deborah Terme, she's a practicing periodontist here in Beverly Hills, a very qualified periodontist. And she was just graduated a few years back, and she came to watch me do a graft. And I was sh uh, showing her how to do a free gingival graft, or she was observing me. And I was struggling a little bit with the suture, and then she asked me, don't, don't you do a T-suture? And I, I asked Deborah, what, what's a T-suture? She said, oh, you go like this, like this, and you go from the side, and it's called a T. And, and, and that's how I learned it. And, and, and again, it's a, it's a humbling experience. You've been practicing for 15 years, and a newly graduate can teach you something. And that's, that's the beauty of it, because you constantly learn. That's, that's excellent. Thanks for sharing. And it goes to... And thanks to Deborah. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's not all programs are... The sa I mean, the, the experience with what... What you learn depends on where you go and who you interact with. Yep. And, and uh, what I love is really finding people who are super qualified and just suctioning their brains. And yep. you're, you know, you're one of them in, in surgery. I love suctioning because you, you have a very clear, like you've systemized the way to suture this. And I'm not going to forget it. And when I go and do this next time, I'm that much more confident. 
Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So it's common sense. Simple things can make a big difference. Uh, the the soft issues, the suturing, can make or break a case. Okay. We have a question. Yep. Uh, is it okay? To oh, answer? sure. Sure. Uh, Dr. Nav Singh, uh, a question in case of shield failure, do you see just the root part getting necrotic? What's the unusual, what's the usual presentation uh, in a case of a shield failure? Great question. Great question. The shield failure is really not the shield failure in that sense. The sheet shield is the inability to do a shield. That, these are the biggest uh, complications, the inability to create a shield like you wanted, like the whole case gets messed up and you just want to take the whole thing out. That's yeah. the number one challenge we have. But there are two types of problems we can see. Sometimes the shield can loosen up in spite of your best of efforts. You made your split and you tr try to adjust it and, 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 and I'll show more cases like that and try to adjust the shield like you wanted, but it mobilizes and, and it needs to come out. Mm -hmm. And some of these problems are soft tissue growth on the palatal aspect of the shield and delayed infection. When, you, when the whole thing gets infected, the shield gets infected. Not the shield, but the tissue around it, and then it needs to be removed. And, and the way you handle it is like, like a bone graft infection. You have to basically graft depending on what the situation presents itself. And from an administrative point of view, because you know, you can know all the clinical stuff administratively. If you fail, it's hard. If you're charging for a, 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 a socket shield and you go in there and it infects, it doesn't work, uh, you've still input that amount of time and you, you gave it a shot. Um, what's your philosophy on that? Okay. Do you give the patient the money back or do you... That's a great question. Like, what do you do? That's a great question, a common question, because you see, not all, all of our procedures are go not of all of your procedures are going to be successful, and same, same with me. So it's really not a question of what's ethical or what's clinically appropriate. It's a practice management question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so think about it. The patient came in, you proposed treatment A with the different steps in the sequence. It didn't work out. Now you're going to plan B. So from a patient perspective, to be punished twice, have the procedure not work out, now paying full fee all over again, maybe the procedure not working out the second time and you, now you go third time, they can lose confidence. Besides, procedures are costly and sometimes cost prohibitive in the first place. So from a practice management point of view, I believe that my, my philosophy is that it's the cost of doing business. So you do it at no charge. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very reasonable to charge only for the materials. But then you're becoming a little bit of a dollars and cents doctor. Got it. You are a little bit petty. Okay, you know, pay me $50 for this and $100 for that. It doesn't present you as a real confident doctor with authority that, you know, looks, you know, you want to look at the big picture. So personally, if something doesn't work out, like the cases I've shown you so far, I will redo it at no extra cost. Got it. And if something doesn't work, I, I, I refund. And there's a way to do that. One more okay. question. Yep. If there's an alveolar mucosa on an implant site, uh, if, or if there's mucosa on, the, on an implant site, then soft tissue augmentation has to be done prior to implant or at stage two surgery. Also, do you do a CTG or a free G okay. FGG? So yeah, that's like, we, like before. So basically, mm -hmm. basically, you, you want to graft before. You want to idealize your site from a bone and heart perspective. And that's really what this case is showing. So you want right. to do it before. And a free gene graft is better. Okay, and I'll, and I'll show different cases like that. So the graft is taken from the smooth part of the palate, the hard palate. And depending on the site, it has to, and I'll give you some guidelines. It has to be two millimeters away from the gingival margin. It has to be away from the rugen, away from the soft palate. It has to be 1.5 millimeter in thickness. Okay, so you have those four guidelines that you need to follow. These in are golden. In, 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 our, in our live courses, we do the, the hands-on and you learn and we do the live training so you, you know exactly how to do that. Because this graft, if harvested properly and sutured properly wow. and stable, stabilized properly, will heal properly. And again, from a suturing perspective, there's really not much to it. I, you know, for this part type of suturing, there's no need to align. It's already aligned. It's like arts and crafts. It is, it's, it feels good when you It's apply. like arts and crafts. It's not like something's gonna pull on you. Mm -hmm. It's enough to align, to, to align it first without suturing. 
you can do the split the difference, no problem. So suture in both ends and one in the middle and split the difference. Mm -hmm. That's really the same, same principle that I showed you before. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's nothing complex about it. Yet, when you focus on simplicity and you focus on a good strategy for suturing, the good tactics, tactics meaning how to hold your instruments, what type of suture material, how to make your wrist movements, okay? The, the, the wrist twist, okay? We need to know these things. Your grafts are going to work, okay? The pinky, the pinky I've been using, it's Pinky awesome. hold, yeah. Oof. The pinky hold is going to change the world. It is. Oh, it's changing <laughs> the world already, okay? <laughs> so one, one of those doctors uh, coming up to this broadcast, a suturing question. You know, suturing takes time. I don't know the fancy suturing techniques like epithelial grafts. Whoever's asked this question, okay, the name it doesn't matter. That's not difficult to do. That's simple. Actually, there's no such thing as a fancy technique. It's all about strategy and tactics that can all be learned. And naturally, it's all covered in Suture Academy. Small grafts, large grafts all heal the same way. They stay vascularized, the epithelium peels off, let it heal for six to eight weeks get good tissue, place wow. your implants. It's a different ball game, okay? Soft tissue skills make it or break it. It's your, it's your secret weapon, okay? Uh, you know, in this broadcast, whoever's watching, we have a few hundred doctors watching, we, we will probably have a few thousand views on Facebook and on social media. We sometimes get to 10,000 views for one broadcast. There are some tips in here that you didn't learn before because they were maybe too simplistic or my, mundane or boring for the teachers you were listening to or the speakers you were listening to because they showed you the fancy stuff. They wanted to impress you. They wanted to show you how they do things difficult and in a fancy way. The reality is, and I come from the trenches, from private practice, the reality is the simpler, the better. The faster, not always the better, but the fastest way to reach the goal, the better it is. You don't have to overcomplicate cases, okay? And, and suturing is really a great example. And that's how you differentiate yourself. As more people do implants and it becomes more common knowledge, then it, it behooves people to really set yourself apart. And by knowing how to develop implant sites, you, you might do it better than some people who have been doing it for many years. And, and that's what my experience has been yeah. like. Soft tissue skills make it or break it. Yeah. Really, that's really all about that. You know, a lot of a lot of dentists can drill into bone and place implants and even use guided surgery, but the soft tissue skills is something about it. And, and that's why it so happens that I work with a lot of other surgical specialists that refer cases to me, like an oral surgeon, send me this case. Nobody's fault, but there's recession. Why is there recession? Why? It's pretty you, mucosa. Mucosa, yeah. no attached tissue or minimally attached tissue. What is minimally attached tissue or, or mucosa? What does it have? What's the predominant fiber? It's elastin. Mm. It's elastic tissue. It's like pulling. It's like a rubber band. It's going to pull on the tissue. It's going to cause recession. And that's hard to treat. And it's hard to, to fix. And I, and, and I never promise anybody, any patient, any doctor that I work with, or any one of my mentees or the students I work with, that you can fix recession. Now, if you go to a lecture and you see 10 cases of how the speaker covered recession, you, in your, your brain says, oh, it's possible, it's predictable. It's not, it's not predictable. It's not a root surface. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is improve the tissue quality. And you can use a free gingival graft, same technique, expose the periosteum. Hopefully it doesn't show, meaning it's not in a visible area. Hopefully there's a low smile line, which it was. Expose the periosteum, create some bleeding points or bleeding areas. Take your free gingival graft, suture it, glue it into place with periacryl. Okay, again, there's not much to it. Split the difference technique. Use periacryl for stability. And even if the patient doesn't have a you know, great oral hygiene, you can see that the graft is vital from underneath. And you see some breakfast or lunch, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. I think it looks like parsley. Yeah, I didn't taste it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't check it out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's the testament, not, 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 you know, joking aside, it's the testament how resilient this graft is. Wow. And it carotenizes within three weeks. It's going to heal, like, give it some time. 
Okay, not promising root coverage, but it did improve. Okay, it does improve. So soft tissue skills make it or break it. It's a secret weapon. It's it's the unfair advantage. Thanks for sharing that with with me first of all, and with whoever is listening, because this is golden. And the confidence it gives you when you're diagnosing implants and how you look at it. You know, I, I work in, uh, with, with different doctors and some people will diagnose the implants and I do them. So I, I train their eye. I'm like, you know, Dr. Simon, it's very important, told me to make sure you have enough attached gingiva. So whenever you're diagnosing an implant and referring it to me, just check the bone width and also check the, uh, the tissue. And it's funny how very qualified doctors, it's, it's a matter of really making it at the front of mind. Thing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's all about awareness. You see, if you live in the dark, you don't know where light is, then you don't know. But it's like, you know, people that can't hear or see, all of a sudden medicine gives them vision and hearing. They're like, wow, this mm -hmm. is a whole new world. And the soft tissue is exactly the same thing. This is really... Uh, you know, big light. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that your grafts will always work out. Sometimes grafts can across. Even under the best circumstances, they lose their vascularity. The patient is a smoker. I sutured maybe too, too much on top of the root surfaces and not enough on the vascular bed. These things can happen. Luckily, soft tissue grafts that fail will disappear, disintegrate within a week or two. Mm -hmm. Done. Then you have to restart. But the hard part is how to communicate, what to say. Okay, so there are basically two types of conversations that we have to have with the patient. Conversation number one is when you detected the problem, when you detected the issue. And this is where you say only what you know so far, although, although you know more things, but say only what is obvious right now explain only the next step, what you're planning to do, and, uh, and I'll show you what to do with these graphs. Focus on the immediate future only. So this is like a quick conversation where I tell the patient, this and that happens, and I'll give you the exact verbal skills, and then I, I do what I need to do. And these, these are some useful sentences. And I, I tell the patient, you know, uh, John, looks like your graft lost blood supply, and there could be an infection around it. It looks like it. So I'm not going to use terminology or verbiage that is very medical. Uh, jargon. John, jargon. Not, not John, you know, the, the graft uh, lost the, the uh, vascularity and the um, you don't want to sound like capillaries. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> want, you want to talk like, hey, you know, your graft, Rashad, your graft, it looks like your graft got infected. Looks like it lost some blood supply. And I'll get you comfortable, I'll put some anesthetic in there, I'll put some topical, I'll take a closer look. What does it mean closer look? I'll do something. Yeah. Okay, but I'll take a closer look and I'll give you more information when I'm done, okay? Awesome. Keep it simple, explain things, hang in there, John, it's not going to take long. Mm -hmm. Okay, give them like a little, like it's like conversation number one, simple. Okay, and, and what I do with these types of grafts that fail, I give some topical anesthesia or, or even an injection sometimes, remove the loose part parts, remove the sutures, irrigate with some saline. That's it. That's the handling. Because this graft, once it's not integrated, once it's necrotic, get it out of there and it will heal faster. So now it's time for conversation number two. Conversation number two is, has a five-part framework. Okay, The first one has focus on what's immediate, three mm -hmm. parts. This is five parts. Discuss number one. Discuss what you found. What you found. Okay, So that gives you a, an impression or a, portrays you as a doctor that seriously looked into the problem and investigated and what you found. For example, there was some necrotic tissue, there was some lack of blood supply. Explain what you did in simple terms. Give instructions, post-op instructions, explain what's next, short future, long future, and answer all of the questions, mm -hmm. not one questions and move all of the questions, even if it takes an hour. And give the patient your phone, phone number and, and tell them, you know, if something wasn't clear, give me a call later on. And what do you do with that guilt that pops up inside you? Like, the guilt? Yeah, like, uh, like when something fails initially, if you don't have, 
if you're in the early stages of adoption? The guilt, the guilt, I, I, I squash it. You squash it. I squash the guilt. Okay. Why? Because I know, and you know, and everybody watching this, this, um, this broadcast knows that when we treat patients, we treat them with all our heart, with the biggest intention and the best intentions to do good and improve their lives, improve their situations, and, and help them with their problems. There's no room for guilt. Now, if you made a surgical error, I'll probably feel bad or I will feel bad and I will think about the error or the mistake in a proactive way, in a corrective way. What can I do next time to make it better? Now, if I'm constantly getting the same problem, the same mistake over and over, I'm doing something wrong, hey, I got to fix this problem. You need knowledge and mentorship. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happens. A lot of doctors get into a guilt trip and they get into what we call the damaging cycle, which is a vicious cycle, thinking about what, what's going on and they become less confident. All this guilt comes out and the patient sees them and, and basically leaves them because they lose trust. Okay, follow the framework, follow these questions. Here's some useful sentences, okay? It appears that, it looks like, it looks like, be soft. An infection developed around the graft. It looks like it lost blood supply. But don't worry, it's all clear now. You're at no risk. I had to remove the graft in the process because once the graft is, has no more blood supply, it's not gonna work or it has an infection. I needed to remove it. It's a temporary setback. It wasn't alive, okay? Thank you. Simple, simple words. I realize and be empathetic. I realize it's a temporary setback. That means we need to wait two, three, four months or weeks, whatever the problem was. Uh, try not to get discouraged. It's going to be fine. I'm going to take good care of you. We're still on track to replace your tooth or your graft. And I totally understand how you feel. I would feel the same way. You know, I, I don't like when my patients have complications. Unfortunately, medicine is never 100%. You can say that. that medicine is never 100%. There could be some complications. Don't say you signed the consent. It was in the consent. You it's your problem, not it, mine. No, it's <laughs> we are in it together. I got you covered. I got you covered. S speak some slang. Yeah. Tr uh, by the way, doctors from all over the world, translate it into your own language. Make it your own. It's all going to work out just fine. F feel free to call me anytime for questions. Okay, I'm here for you. Ask me anything. Okay, these are useful sentences. Not all of your grafts are going to work out. Sometimes they're going to partially work. You see one graft, one side. Took, the other side didn't. Why? Post-operative. There's a million reasons, right? Well, not to, yeah, there could I be mean, blood, su blood supply. Yeah. Basically, it's, you see the tissue is talking to us. Mm -hmm. The mesial part is talking to us and the distal part is talking to us. Okay, so this part is saying I'm happy. Mm -hmm. I'm red. This part is saying, this one is saying I'm red. This one is saying I'm dead. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm dead. Uh -huh. It's talking to you. Don't, you. don't you hear the words? Well, the more I listen to you, the more I understand. Yeah, but I, I don't really need to be here. You just look at it so you know that it was a vascularity problem. Now, that does not mean, does not mean that it's not a mistake that I've made. Maybe I, I, I didn't create enough of a vascular bed. Maybe the graft should have been more apical. Maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't have, go, shouldn't have gone to the, for the root coverage. Okay? So communication... And human connection is the key to personal and career success. Communication between people. If you can master communication and human connection, you're unstoppable. And you don't have to be the best clinician, although I want you to be the best clinician. And I, I try to be the best clinician I can be, and I want to be better than what I am right now. But over 20 years, I read so many books, and I focused on the psychology of communication. For a $20 book, no, I'm sorry, what 20? 20 is expensive. For a $5 book, you can get somebody's life's work on human connection, how to talk to people, how to influence people, how to create authority. It's all there. And I, you know, and I share these resources in, in our courses because that's the key to personal, personal and career growth and success. Well, on behalf of all general dentists, I want to thank you because you are really empowering people all around the world and and you know th th this world <coughs> has it has sharks and it has people like you so thank, thank you but well, let's be part of the sharks well you know there's bad sharks so pinhole why not use a pinhole technique mm -hmm. to cover that recession and the uh, 
the the implant, the one that was re 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 the, the one that the implant case. It's possible. Dr. Eric is asking. It's about. possible, Dr. Eric. It's possible to use the pinhole. Again, covering recession around implants is not a predictable procedure. It's not. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it gets worse as you treat it. Pinhole or no pinhole. Pinhole is a great technique. But don't focus on that. Focus on talking to the tissue, the tissue talking to you. If there's no way the blood supply will come from, if an implant has some bone loss around it, you can pull the tissue coronally all you want, but it's not going to work because biologically there's not enough blood supply. And that case had minimal attached gingiva. Are you talking about the canine? The, the white, the yeah. uncovered implant. So pinhole does not really fix uh, increasing P the... Pinhole sometimes can, can improve the attached tissue, but again, not always predictably. Mm -hmm. But there are many techniques for root coverage. Oh, I, I want us to get out, get, off, get out of the mindset when it comes to root coverage or implant coverage that one technique is superior to the other one. Okay, There are different ones. Because we can learn from our mistakes. There are, we all make mistakes soft tissue mistakes. I'm going to share some and I'm going to give some, you know, what not to do. Okay, this patient has a, a hopeless tooth with a large periapical lesion. You see, you don't need to always reflect a large flap for a fenestration. I know I showed you a case before where I did it. I did that. But that's because I couldn't debride all the infection out through the socket. But if you can, if you have clear borders and you can really feel that, hey, this, I remove the cyst, it's there. You don't have to reflect a large flap. Not always, okay? So there's a time to flap, there's a time to do an extraction flap this. Mm. Number two, don't make vertical releasing incisions in the mid-buckle. It's the worst area. You see, that's my mistake. Don't do that because that's an area that is hard to approximate and it tends to recede. Don't do that. Very important. Now, the grafting is the grafting. You'll have to use a containment mechanism like a membrane, you'll have to uh, graft it with bone, collagen, membrane collagen plug, PRF plug, whatever you want. But the vertical release is going to be a weak spot. And there's a very good chance that this is going to recede on you. Very, very good chance. So a lot of us, including myself doing this case, focused more on the bone and the site and getting bone for the implant forgetting that the implant has some neighboring teeth. We don't want to compromise them. So yes, I got a great site for an implant when a site that was completely destroyed. And I, I got great bone, type 2 bone for an implant site. This is when you see drills, when you see the bone coming along the flutes of the drill. It's a good feeling. That's a good feeling that's good bone, mm -hmm. okay? And good positioning, fully guided. But I got recession, mm -hmm. okay? So don't forget that. Now. Some, some dentists are asking me, again, it's a suture question, how to hold the instrument without quivering? I had to look this one up. Quivering means Shake. shaking, okay? Trembling or shaking, okay? Well, don't overcomplicate it. Use instruments that are organically comfortable in your hands, like the Castro, Viejo. Castro Viejo, okay? So if you have a Castro Viejo, as opposed to a needle holder, a, a let's say Mio Heger, this is held with a pen grasp. Okay? So you can do your wrist movements very, very gently. You're not gonna quiver. Okay, quiver is shaking. You don't want that. Okay? You're gonna be very confident. So use the right instruments, use the right holding, learn about how to hold your needles and your suture, how to engage them. One of them Rashad men mentioned before, the pinky hold. The pinky hold is changing the world. Okay, since people are hearing about that, all we hear is pinky hold. Pinky hold is when you start suturing, you're going to hold the suture material uh, under the pinky, and this, this will remove the excess suture material from the site. So what are we going to do about that? Okay, how does it work? Very simple. Okay, you can look at me. So basically, I'll remove the suture material from the package. Okay, I'll grab the needle about 90 degree, but what I want to show you now is that with the thread, okay, I'm going to grab it with my pinky, okay, and that's what you see in the picture. And then I remove the excess suture material from the site and I can move my wrist 
in a, in a pen grasp. Okay, so very, very simple. So no need to quiver, no need to tremble or shake. Okay, we don't have, you know, Parkinson's, okay? This, pink, the, this pink you hold, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, of course. It, it's like, imagine you're running with pants that are, not, that, that are big on you and, and it's hard to walk or run mm. in them versus having pants that fit you right. Once you remove that thread from in front of you, it's just, it feels great. I mean, just try it. And you great, great. <laughs> Go for the pinky hold. <laughs> pinky okay? hold. And it's all in Suture Academy. Okay, so uh, in a pen grasp, pinky hold, the thread control, castor control. The quivering does not come from a medical problems. It has to do with confidence. It has to do with how you hold your instruments. Okay, so the doctor that has problems with quivering, uh, don't worry about it here. We're looking at the wrapping around. Learn how to wrap the suture around your fingers. Control the needle, how to hold it in between, how to lock the sutures. That's really important. All these things are in Suture Academy. And other doctors ask me how to get the first initial knot to be tight so it doesn't open up. Very common problem. So a lot of doctors are doing their twists, cool, and then the second as they do the second twist, it moves away. It usually comes because they pull away. Mm. One of the laws of suturing, law number eight, that you learn about in Suture Academy is as you make your, th uh, your twists, you want to keep the tension flat with the tissue and you don't want to pull away. As you pull away, you make everything unstable, okay? So don't pull away. Okay, so let's look at a couple of more interesting aesthetic cases as we get uh, more and more into this uh, broadcast. If you're watching us on, on social media, head over to Surgical Master Live. Uh, like and share this broadcast on your page and other forums and join us because we are uh, just getting into that uh, learning about soft tissues and suturing awesome <coughs> okay so here's a tricky case and Rochelle I wanted to get your opinion here this patient was referred to me to replace tooth number nine okay this patient has a relatively high smile line and this is how the patient presented with a central incisor that is a little bit longer. She already had a steady crawling thing in the past. Why? Because she broke the tooth once. Shows you the danger of doing a steady crawling thing on one tooth. Because if the tooth fails, she was relatively ha happy for a few years. But if the tooth fails, now we have to extract the tooth, the whole thing is going to come loose. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is a high risk. Yeah. So make the patient aware. Tell them that you know they're, they're presenting with a 13 millimeter central incisor. 13 millimeters. What is the average? 10.5. Mm -hmm. So if we extract the tooth, which we're about to, okay, because the, when the tooth, uh, when the crown comes off, there's nothing left. When you lose the tooth, we lose the bone, we lose the tissue, we get more recession, okay? So we have to talk to the patient because we're already starting from a point of asymmetry. What is the best option? Hands down, orthodontic extrusion. Yep. Okay, extrude the tooth very, very slowly creates some more bone and tissue, creates some in excess. We worked on some cases before. I showed you some cases uh, where it works real well. But the patient said, no. Oh. No. I'm not going to do orthodontic. I'm not going to pay a couple of thousand dollars. I'm okay. Patient is saying, I'm okay if you give me the same outcome, if it looks exactly the same. And are, we, are you sure? I'm sure. I'm going to be okay because there's no way to go back. Once you don't do the orthodontic extrusion, there's no way to create some vertical height or it's not predictable. So in terms of patient's expectations, we're going to aim for the same height. So let's see how this case develops. Okay, it's a really interesting case. Okay. Naturally, we're thinking about socket shielding. Mm -hmm. Okay, Na naturally. <coughs> and you can see from the scan that the bone was, is slightly more apical. Slightly more apical compared to the adjacent. Why? Because it was removed. There was some crawling thinning done. Okay, so we have a problem with that. That's not, that. That can actually change when it comes to orthodontic extrusion. Orthodontic extrusion, when it's done properly and slowly with the right vectors, will bring bone and soft tissue in a, in a coronal direction. But the patient refused that. So here I did something interesting. I planned an implant in the wrong position. What does it mean? I planned it in the wrong position. I planned it so by using the, this implant position, I'm going to grind the tooth out, 
creating the socket shield, okay? That's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. So I left myself a millimeter or so on the buckle. I planned an implant. I'm not going to place the implant, but I'm going to use a surgical guide and the implant drills to drill through this tooth and create my socket shield. Because we're, I already said, socket shielding is tricky. Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking it can be simple. So how am I going to do that? So I'm going to plan it in the wrong position. Okay, I'm going to fabricate a guide. Okay, so here's the positioning of the implant. I mean, this positioning is a bit too much to the buckle by design. I'm going to place my guide. I'm going to start drilling through the guide. I'm, I actually made a little split mesodistally just to make it easier. Placed my drills, started to create that, and as I progressed with the ostotomy, the socket shield was created. That's a very elegant way to do a socket shield. Very elegant. Very elegant. We want to be elegant. You are elegant. We want to be elegant, okay? <laughs> so another key principle of socket shielding is don't leave the socket shield too coronal. I used to, and I had some complications. So keep it at bone level. This is the current consensus, or so slightly above, but around the bone level, and create a bevel. And what is the bevel towards the palatal? The bevel is to create some restorative freedom for emergence profile. If you keep it too close to the implant, you won't be able to mobilize the tissue. Mm -hmm. So how do you trim it down? You can reflect the flap, or you can retract with an instrument. There are now spe specialized instruments for socket shielding for that. I just use a small elevator to be careful. So shield at bone level with a bevel. I go for the delayed approach, graft it, place a PRF plug on top of it, X suture. There's really no strategy here. Basically two, three X sutures right on top of the other and let it heal. She has a removable appliance. It heals real quick. Why? Shield is there. Look at the... This is amazing. Isn't it nice? Stippling. Mm -hmm. Stippling. Now what happens to the tissue height? Okay, let's be critical. Okay. There's a little defect. A little defect, but height-wise, it's kind of the same. It did mm -hmm. not change. Mm -hmm. Bottom mm -hmm. line, did not change. So now, I get a second CT scan. Now I plan the implant in the right restorative position. I have a virtual wax up. Uh, you can use a, an actual wax up and scan it in, and I plan it. Now, what I discovered is that my socket shield was not complete. I left a sliver of the palatal, so of the palatal root. And very often, root structure is pretty much the same color and consistency as bone, especially palatal bone, which is very hard, and I could not tell. So basically, what I, I unintentionally created is a socket ring, <laughs> okay? Socket ring. It's the first socket ring in the world, or at least documented and presented. And a, it's gold. And it's gold, exactly. <laughs> Everything is gold here. So, uh, you know, I, I was... A little bit upset initially, thinking, oh, oh my God, I, you know, I should remove it. But then I started the planning, and I looked at it, and I said, you know what, what's the difference? The implant goes a bit apical anyhow, so it preserved the, the palatal bone. Nothing wrong with that. So my planning goes as planned. I'm still good with height. Uh, what's the best surgical approach? Uh, Tissue is talking to you. Um, not, and not there's no right or wrong? I, I would not do a punch in this one. Okay. W okay, so... Or would you? It, it's possible. I w you know what? There's no right or wrong. I was contemplating because mm -hmm. the, the, what I looked at, you know, the only way to create a little bit more height is to do a flap. And how would it work? I would make, I would make an incision somewhere here mm -hmm. and then mobilize it to the buckle. But this is what killed it. You see this slight opening here? It's not going to heal well. There's actually a, an incomplete healing in the tissue. So this goes out the window. Mm -hmm. It's not even an option. So if I had to reflect the flap, the flap would have to go through this defect. Mm -hmm. Or I'll have a, a flap with a fenestration or a, or a, um, a, a um, communication. Mm -hmm. So I went with the punch approach. Okay. Okay? But... I was seriously contemplating flap versus punch, and I only, once I anesthetized the patient and I kind of probed the area, I noticed that this section here is communicating with the socket. Okay. So it basically, you, can do a f you cannot do a flap, and it won't be an advantage. It won't be an advantage. So I went with a punch technique. 
through the same process, finished my osteotomy. Uh, the, the osteotomy is, is fully guided. The placement is fully guided. Placement, three and a half millimeters subgingival. So if you have a healing abutment that is three millimeters and it's slightly submerged, you get yourself three and a half. Mm -hmm. And it covers a little bit. So all you want to do as it heals is to connect the profiling abutment, which guides you with the profiling. Use a, a dedicated drill that clears some of the bone around it, maybe some of the shield, mm -hmm. okay, the, the socket ring, and place a more tapered abutment and a little bit taller. Beautiful. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we got it done. Now, from a, from a height perspective... It's kind of the same. It's kind of the same. It's kind of the same. So I was a little bit discouraged when I saw the patient with a provisional that looked like that. Mm. And it's not a bad result. And it's pretty much what the patient had initially. Mm -hmm. It's actually a little bit better. On the right side, it's the implant provisional. On the left side is the tooth. So I think we're, we're pretty much the same. Slight recession on number eight. Okay, we have to be critical. Okay, we're going to point out a, a slight recession here compared to the baseline. So we do have some side effects, but the contours are much nicer around the implant. I'm thinking, how did it happen? Technically, what we needed to do is with the provisional, and maybe it's not too late, under contour it. Yeah. Under contour the cervical part because I was pretty much at the same level. Okay, no excuses here. Okay, you know, patient is happy as is. We're pretty much at the same level. If we under contour, we'll get the same height. We may not have bulk but we get the, the height, which makes a big difference. And we definitely have the soft tissues. How long would it take to uh, mold the tissue if you under contour it? Do you go- Quickly, it takes, a, it takes a couple days. Like how many, when you under contour it, do you bring them back and give a bigger contour? Or like how long do you send you, you them see, You see, I don't do, I don't do the restorative the, part, the restorative part okay. but in my knowledge, mm -hmm. you, you contour the tooth or under contour the crown rather, and bring it back next week. Okay and check, is the tissue moving in the right direction? Maybe you need to now over contour a little bit and get, get to the perfect balance. Okay, but patient's expectations were addressed because it did not change. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was a very smart patient and we have a good restorative position. What happens on the socket ring? So far, so good. No, no, no difference, okay, so socket ring is still a new thing. Okay? Succeeded. Succeeded, have success here. Okay, so aesthetic zone cases are tricky, especially when you have large infections, you have a high smile line, you have teeth that are long to begin with. This is a different case, 13 millimeters long, large infections, large fistula. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from the lateral or the central? The defect is right in between. Well, you kind of suspect the central incisor, but Anytime you have an infection in between teeth, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. You need to create a flap design that will address the defect. You, you probably can't do it or shouldn't do it flapless because these defects are very hard to, keep, to, to clean out. Okay, you see the defect is right in between the teeth. This, this extraction is simple, right? But we have a large defect. There's a full missing buckle plate right in here. There is something even more worrisome, that's the exposure of the root surface of the adjacent tooth. That's our limiting factor, remember? Mm -hmm. So this case is heading towards disaster. This is a, almost like a red flag, potentially. So here's the defect, it's defective on the palate. So listen, you're there already. Might as well make the best out of it and graft to the best of your ability. Use a resorbable membrane, use a non-resorbable, but do something to retain some of the volume. The patient can always go with a bridge option. Okay, we don't, you know, we don't want to discount that. The root surface that is exposed, I scale root plane, I chemically prepare it with EDTA, I rinse it out, I use endogain, which is meant to improve the attachment. I use a bone graft material, I kind of align my, my membrane on the buckle. Use everything that I can. All Growth the guns. factors. Pardon? All the guns. All my <laughs> ammunitions, all the guns I shoot in there. And I create stability. Now in terms of how to suture it, we now know the key principle is alignment. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so we want to align first. Okay, we want to close up the vertical releasing incision just at the top, at the coronal part. Align around the, the lateral incisor. The fistula is going to still be here. Mm -hmm. Stay away from it. And then switch all the rest. Patient's going to heal pretty well. Very nice. It's going to heal pretty well. He, he actually compl complained mostly about a canker sore. Okay, <laughs> healed really nice. Now, is it going to stay like that? Not likely, because mm -hmm. if you have a defect between two teeth, you can't fool nature. You can't have tissue hiked up for a full papilla and have, it have no bone underneath, even bone that you placed in there. So we have to live with some compromise, but as you mold the tissue and reprep the teeth, this patient is going to be ready for an implant, okay, and actually be healed real well. Here's a guided plan. Uh, the bone is adequate, okay, not the best bone in the world, but it's really workable mm -hmm. in terms of what we have. I'm going to place a relatively long implant. Flap design, this case was not done. Actually, I was supposed to do it tomorrow, but we postponed it. I'm still contemplating. I'll see the day off. I may decide to go with a flapless approach mm -hmm. because I don't want to damage this architecture. You see this architecture here? Mm -hmm. I may have to go with either a minimal approach with a vertical release or a flapless because if I'm going to release the tissue on the lateral, it's going to go even more in an apical direction. Okay? Would you do a, 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 a pedicle from the lingual rotated it's to It's possible. Mm -hmm. It's possible to do. But remember, the pedicle helps with thickness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help with height so much, but it's an option. Thanks for mentioning that. That's a great option. Okay, so another question about suturing. How to suture around teeth and move flaps coronally? Well, the technique, for example, for a connective tissue graft is a sling suture. Let's make it, let's do a little demo on the, sure. on the Z pad. Okay, because that's a question here from, from a doctor. Okay, excellent. So let's, let's just do a little demo because a, lo a lot of doctors are asking me, how do we suture around teeth in a coronal direction? Okay, how does it work? Okay, so that's to uh, hike up the tissue? How to hike up the tissue. So basically, when you're thinking about a sling suture, and Rashad, you'll be in charge of this camera here to make yes, sure. Yes, yes. Okay, when you think about a sling suture, and we're going to work on the Z-pad. Let's get a, little, a nice view on the Z-pad. Not the mini, the maxi. Zipa 2.0. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's zoom on section number five. Okay, and I'm going to move it towards it. Mm -hmm. Like this. Let's get the water away. Okay, I think we're good here. Okay, so the idea behind a sling suture is to take the flap and suture it around the teeth. So when you tighten the knot, the flap is going to move in a coronal direction and towards the teeth. So here's one of the, one of the ways to do this. Okay, engage one papilla, take the needle out, and then pass underneath the contact point. You don't have to engage the lingual tissue or the interproximal tissue. Simply pass underneath the contact area. Okay, so pull the needle through, and then you wrap around in a distal direction in the distal direction, pass underneath the distal contact, pull it through and make sure that the suture wraps around the height of contour of the tooth. So your assistant actually has to pull it down or tug it down. If not, it will try to escape. Luckily, teeth have a height of contour so it stays tucked down. And then you engage the distal papilla about two millimeters from the edge of the flap so you don't get a cut out. Pull the needle out and to create a sling suture all you need to do now 
is follow your footsteps. So if you moved from mesial to distal and wrapped around the tooth, all you need to do is what we call a U-turn. Basically follow your footsteps and move back. So all I'm going to do is go back, pass underneath the distal contact area, pass underneath, Okay, and then wrap around the tooth in the mesial direction and pass underneath the mesial contact area. Okay, again, making sure that as it passes in a mesial direction, the thread material is tucked underneath the height of contour. That's your assistant's job to do this with a cot cotton pliers or an instrument. And this was actually one of the uh, repeating questions in our survey, how to train our assistants. So when you tie the knot, what's going to happen is that the flap is going to move in a coronal direction and towards the tooth. So I'm going to make two twists in one direction. Okay, bicycle movement. Let's see if we can see Let's it here. Uh, yeah. Let's zoom out a little bit. Uh -huh. So a little bit on the macro. My, my right hand is holding the Castro in a pen grasp. My left hand is holding the needle in the swaged part. I'm doing something called the wrap around and locking. And now I'm going to do what we call the bicycle movement. Okay, a lot of doctors are doing the following. They are holding the needle holder static and wrapping the, the, the suture material around it. No, the movement is like a bicycle. Both hands are moving. Okay, so how, does, how is this going to work? Okay, two twists in one direction. Lock with the castro. Keep it flat, don't pull away. One of the laws of suturing. And the back and forth to stabilize the first knot. This is the answer to one of the doctors that asked the question. Okay, so second in the other direction. and in the final direction, okay? So basically, when you finish off a sling suture, what you should be seeing is that the flap is moving, let's move to the picture again, the screen. What you'll be seeing is that the flap is moving in a coronal direction and towards the teeth, and this is really the principle of a sling suture or for grafting, okay? Now, some of these procedures will have some side effects. As you coronally position tissue, as you release the tissues, you can create some hematoma. So don't be surprised if your patient will have some skin bruising and things like that. It's uh, actually pretty common. And the same is true when, you, when you're doing a pinhole procedure or a tunneling procedure, a Vista, or even a gumdrop by Dr. Delia Tuttle, okay, our friend from the Divas in Dentistry. By the way, Delia, shout out to you. Congrats on uh, everything that you do. And also, uh, good luck with the conference in Spain coming up uh, this year. Encourage everybody that can make it show up to this conference, divasindentistry.com. Okay, give him a little bit of a plug here because uh, these, uh, these uh, women, these surgeons are amazing and they, they, we support them uh, full heartedly. So, Bruising and swelling is part of it. So if you're doing, let's say, a, a, a soft tissue coverage procedure with a tunnel or a pinhole, whatever that may be, you can have complications. You can have an infection. You can have swelling and things like that. That may happen. And sometimes patients will swell up on their face. Why does the buccal space get in swollen? We just did a little tunnel. So the reason being, if we are now undermining the soft tissue, whichever technique it is, and we're mobilizing the tissue in a coronal direction, even if I suture it properly, we are releasing beyond the insertion of the buccal, the buccinator muscle. So we are releasing beyond the insertion to bone. We are releasing it. So if something gets infected more coronally, it can travel to the cheek, which is the buccal space. So, you see, it's common sense 
if you know the anatomy, if you know why somebody would have a buccal space infection, we know that somebody who has a root canal problem will swell up. Why? Because the infection travels through the apex. It's the same reason, just it's not a root canal problem. Mm -hmm. Okay? I want you to be open-minded, but don't get discouraged. A lot of these infections, a lot of these problems can resolve, can resolve in the best, in the best possible way. Okay? I want everybody to be aware. Now, I'm ready for my water if possible. Okay. Uh, here is, a, here is a, an interesting case, in, in a steady case that, you know, maybe not everybody wants to tackle, but that's really what makes me, makes me go and makes me want to make a difference. This patient has a tremendous infection around the central incisor, pretty high smile line. Okay, pretty high smile line. If we lose the papilla, if we lose the tissue, this is going to be a disaster. And if we lose it even five years later, still. Okay? So preoperative CT scan is a must. You see a tremendous infection on the palate. Why is this so worrisome to me? Why? Because when you remove that tooth, it'll just shrink. The palate is our last hope. Is our last hope. Why? Because when you lose a tooth, you lose mostly the buccal plate, which is mostly alveolar bone. The palatal bone is more basal bone. It stays. Now we don't have it. Oh, my God. So we need to use the socket shield. We, are, we, we must use the socket shield to give this chance a, a, a great chance to heal. Here's the scan. The extraction is simple between you and me. Not difficult. Yeah. The, the tooth will just come out. But I want to preserve the buccal plate. So how are we going to do that? Uh, I asked the dentist to remove the crown for me. Okay, crown is off. Now we're looking at what's left of the tooth. Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. So I'm going to first do the socket nice. shield. I'm going to split the tooth in half. I'm going to trim. It was not guided. It was not a guided socket shield. It was a manual socket shield, and it's kind of hard. Very hard. It's hard to do because you don't see. But the more you do, the more you overcome those obstacles, the better you become. Okay, so that's kind of the truth. But I, I like to give it the best chance to success. So I'm going to use a pedicle palatal flap. I'm going to reflect the full thickness flap on the corresponding side. I'm going to split this flap in half and take this flap and split it all the way around the lateral incisor, almost to the other central. And then I'm going to, to take this uh, extension, which is now called the pedicle, and I'm going to flip it over to the buckle and create some space underneath and suture it. Now, if this looks a little bit complicated and technique sensitive, it is. But each component of this procedure, the separate parts individually, are actually very simple. I've done, I don't know how many connective tissue grafts in the past years. It's technically like a connective tissue graft without separating the mesial. Mm -hmm. I've done so many extractions. I've done now a lot of socket shields, so I get more comfortable. I've done a lot of suturing. So if you take those relatively simple skills, now you combine them. It's almost like writing a song. The song is made out of notes, cor notes chords, different components. Now, how, you know, you, you don't you know, when, 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 when you learn to play the piano, you don't play Rachmaninoff right away. You know, y y you're going to play um, uh, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Okay, simple. But then it's the same principle. Learn the simple techniques, the simple suturing, the simple soft tissue manipulation, connective tissue graft harvesting. Just for connective tissue graft, don't jump into pedicles. You will naturally, organically transition to that you will naturally learn how to combine those simple procedures and get these types of results. This is just a culmination of years. I wish I knew these techniques before. I wish I, you know, you don't have to spend 20 years to, to learn these things. But if you combine all of these techniques and you know the biology and you understand that, you will have a lot of tissue to work with. Beautiful and, result. And we're not done. We're not done with this case. Okay, I'm still waiting for healing. I'm waiting for the site to mature. Okay, but the point being made, if you're looking at these contours and you see what's feasible by combining multiple simple procedures, it really teaches you that the soft tissue skills make it 
or break it. No doubt about it. It's all about the soft tissue because any other dentist, 9 out of 10, 99 out of 100 would have pulled the tooth and grafted the socket and the, the palatal would have collapsed, the buckle would have collapsed, and we're in disaster. Now, this is not a guarantee. I did my best here and it's looking good and we're not done yet. But at least thinking and utilizing these techniques can gives you, give you a better chance. Okay? Same thing for suturing. When you think about how to suture, it's not just about twisting and being fancy. Actually, the simplest techniques, and that's what I try to convey to you in this broadcast, the, simple th the simpler, the better. First step, alignment. alignment. Get some horizontal mattresses. One, two, three. Split the difference principle. Split the difference, right? It's like splitting the bill. Okay? Then second step, layered suturing. Continuous interlocking with gut sutures. That's the second step. Continuous interlocking. From distal to mesial. The flap is already aligned. It doesn't matter if you start from mesial to distal. Why did I start on the distal? Because as I finish my continuous interlocking, I'm running out of suture material. I want to be closer to the mesial, to the front. Strategy. So it'll be easier. Strategy. That's a strategy. So soft tissue suturing is a critical skill. No doubt about it. You don't need to be fancy. You don't need to be a specialist for that. Suturing can be made simple. It's really what you said before. It's really about learning how to train your eye and your mind and some muscle memory, some hand-eye coordination. Train yourself in that to be great at suturing and soft tissues. And this is really why I created Suture Academy. That's, this is really the, the, the reason behind it to emphasize that you can do the same. You don't have to be a specialist in learning for 20 years and reach, you know, do something fancy. Actually, most procedures, most suturing techniques are very simple. It's strategy and tactics. So if you're a dentist that wants to be successful in surgery, you may be thinking if you can implement the exact techniques I showed you today, the soft tissue techniques, the suturing tactics and strategies, uh, quickly and easily. We all want to do it quickly and easily and this is why I created Suture Academy. And in the next segment I wanted to share with you what's in Suture Academy, which is a system that is specifically designed to create clarity and confidence and teach you suturing so your procedures are successful with a common sense approach, getting rid of complexity and overwhelm keeping it simple and concise so you can get there fast. I don't want you to learn something and take you like five years. I want you to know this in five weeks, in five days or seven days. It's up to you. Sutra Academy is going to help you create stable knots and flaps that don't open. So you have great healing, especially in the aesthetic zone. In Sutra Academy, you're going to learn how to coronally advance tissues, achieve primary closure, closure. so your Guided bone regeneration procedures are going to be successful, not going to get infected. It's going to help you stop the entanglements, the cutouts, the fail grafts, and gain more clarity and confidence when you suture without actually needing to travel. You don't need to travel. You don't have to take time off your practice. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on flights and accommodation and loss of production because you can now learn suturing at your own pace and in your own place. You don't have to travel anywhere because this is the first hands-on in the world that comes to you, is shipped to you. We have Taylor here, our, our uh, assistant and uh, custo customer uh, support is going to ship you your, uh, your Z-pad. So you can do this in a short period of time, as short as seven days, and this is what Sutra Academy is all about, Okay, kind of in a big picture. And in the next segment, I wanted to go over exactly what's included in this training so you know what Suture Academy is and how I can help you with your suturing technique. Know if it's the right thing for you. If it's the right thing for you, then I want you to get it. I want you to try it out. If it's not the right thing for you, then it's not. Then, then you're okay. So this is the next segment where I'm going to basically show you the big picture of what's involved, what's included in Suture Academy. So the first thing that I'm going to teach you out of a big picture point of view, I'm going to show you the movement, how I hold the instruments, the needle, how I wrap around, release, how, what I do with my hands, similar to what I showed you today. 
And the second component is explain step by step all the techniques that I'm using in my practice. And there's a lot of sutures, uh, suture techniques that I am utilizing, explained step by step with 50 different videos. And the third component of this training is clinical. This is where you get the eye-mind muscle training utilizing the Z-pad, the device I just demonstrated on, in learning how to use the movement to create those techniques, to utilize these techniques to help you in the clinical aspect of surgery. I made it so you keep it simple, so you don't get overwhelmed and confused, and make sure that you can learn all these, all these techniques by following, your, following the instructions. So basically what you need to do is follow the Z-pad, okay? So you, you get the Z-pad shipped to you. You get those 50 videos, you follow the instructions. You see what's happening on the screen and you do the same thing on your Z-pad. This is already Z-pad 2.0, so this has already been uh, improved based on the feedback that we received from the first group that took this course. We already have a few hundred doctors that trained on the Z-pad. So all you need to do really is follow the instructions. Don't make up your own rules and invent your own techniques, although you can at some point. Follow the instructions and practice on the Z-pad. Okay, so in Sutra Academy, you have those 50 videos on a dedicated platform, so you can watch each video. These videos are really short. They're between five minutes to mostly, mostly 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. I have one that is maybe 20 minutes. Each video covers a different technique, a different aspect of suturing, some eye and mind training, materials, uh, laws of suturing, uh, how I control the suture material, how I wrap around my fingers, how I use my pinky hold, so you don't have to quiver. You don't have to move your hands. Your hands, your hands don't have to shake and move because what I'm going to show you is really what I use in my practice. Really nothing, nothing else. All of it and nothing else that, uh, that I, I don't use. I mean, if there's some uh, obscure, obscure suturing techniques that you're really interested in, let me know. I'll create a video just for that and I'll include it in Suture Academy. Pretty much everything that you need to know about suturing. So all you need to do is follow the videos, look at the videos, practice on your Z-pad, take this technique in your practice. So you learn how to interlock, double interlocked, du double interlock your sutures, how to close up flaps primarily, learn to sling, learn the single sling and the continuous sling, all of the above, so you can be excellent in suturing in a short period of time. We're looking at about seven days. So every day, I'm going to send you several videos up to seven days. So you can spend probably an hour a day watching them or you can go through the whole program uh, on the weekend when you have time. So take the whole day and just run through it and work with your z -pad and get it done in one day. But in my experience, it helps if you do it slowly and gradually over a few days. And of course, this program is your reference. You're not getting any physical handout. You'll be getting those videos. Those videos are part of the online, online platform. You can always watch them and, and learn all of the techniques that you need for suturing. So you have tight closure of large flaps. You have good healing and successful procedures. Okay, so this is basically what Suture Academy is all about. Simple cases, more difficult cases, aesthetic zone, non-aesthetic zone, grafting procedures, soft tissue, bone grafting, how to suture around tunneling, how to deal with suture complications, things like that. And the doctors that went through the, the training, uh, Dr. Lydia, you probably know her. My lovely sister. Uh, lovely sister went through Suture Academy live. She did Suture Academy for seven hours live soldier in the studio non-stop a little bit of food a little bit of drinks uh, she fails Lydia that this is a real simple technique to learn suturing as a general dentist and, 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 and Lydia wonders you know why isn't the system included in dental school we don't know maybe it will it will maybe we'll soon okay so this is a hands-on course 
that you don't have to travel to, that comes to you. You can practice at home. You can learn the exact techniques that I'm using in my own practice in Beverly Hills dedicated to surgery. So you, there's, there are no secrets anymore. And this way, you can create some clarity in your mind, create the confidence fast. And this is Suturing, Sutra Academy. Okay? Sutra Academy is now open for registration. Uh, the cost to, for, for the online program is $2,497. Okay? And this online course comes with 50 videos. Uh, registration is open at sutraacademy.com. Uh, and the cost for the Z-pad uh, that comes with this training is $1,497. So these numbers uh, add up rather quickly. So uh, the registration is at sutraacademy.com. Okay? To make things simple for you, I added the Suture Atlas. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step technique atlas that includes all the different techniques that are included in the training. It has over 220 illustrations in color, of course, in a clear way and concise way. It includes all the different exercises. So you can have the video in front of you. You can have the Z-pad in front of you. You have the Suture Atlas in front of you. And you can slowly go through these exercises, spend an hour a day, half an hour a day, do it in one day, spend a couple days, spend a couple of weeks. It doesn't matter. Everybody has their own pace. You don't have to rush. Some people like to do things fast. Sometimes it takes longer. Some like to be more visual. Some are more, more hands-on. And most of us are both. So I'm providing you with all the resources so you can learn these techniques in the most simple way and concise way without overcomplicating your life. So I want to send, you out, send out the Atlas to you, the Z-Pad, and give you access to all those 50 videos and for you to get started real quick so you don't have to wait to get started I'm going to send it out to you with a full suturing kit so you'll get all the instruments that you need for suturing the Castro Viejo, the scissors, the cotton pliers send all to you including some sutures no excuse. Once you get the Z-pad and you get this package, and this beautiful package includes all of these things, you can st get started right away. And by the way, this kit can be used in clinical practice. So you can sterilize it once you're done and use it for surgeries. Okay, this is a clinical instruments that can work for you. Okay, so the cost for what I'm sending you, the Sutra Academy Online is 2497 The Z-pad is 1497 the book 497 everything ends with a 7 i guess it's for good luck suturing kit 197 registration is open and what you need to do is go to suture academy to join uh, you see the the page itself there's a little video that explains about the training uh, you'll see exactly what's included in this training you'll see the different bonuses that i'm going to talk about in a second uh, you'll pick your payment plan. We wanted to make this affordable to doctors because these numbers add up. Our goal in the next five years is to train as many dentists as possible in the system. And we have a number in mind. We want to train 10,000 dentists in Suture Academy in the next five years. And that's why we want to reduce the fee for this. We want to make sure that it's more affordable to more doctors. So the full training is short of 2000 so we're going to include all these bonuses or you can use to a two payment plan make sure that it's it's affordable to a lot of doctors so if you want a new system and a hands-on course that comes to you and you want to learn at your own place in your own place in your own practice at home you want to gain the clarity and the confidence Suture Academy is a great choice for you. Uh, this training comes with a full money back guarantee. What does it mean? It means that you can take this training today, get immediate access to the videos, we'll ship you all the resources, we'll ship you the book, we'll ship you the Z-pad 2.0 and the instruments. You can immediately get started and start practicing on the Z-pad and you have four weeks or 30 days to go through the whole program. You'll go through this in seven days. You can get the knowledge and the confidence and the skills and learn all the techniques that I teach there, 50 videos. And if for whatever reason you 
didn't feel it made a difference to you, you were not blown away, you were not happy for some reason, just send us an email, let us know, we'll refund your money back 100%. So we want to eliminate any element of risk in joining this training. We don't want you to feel like, oh my God, you know, what if I, it's a big investment. What if I don't like it? What if it doesn't work for, for me? You can try it out. And like with all the other programs that we offer in Surgical Master, there's no risk whatsoever. Try it out. You liked it, great, keep it. If you didn't like it, send it back, full money back, and you're doing great. Okay, so this is Sutra Academy. SutraAcademy.com is now open, open to registration. Uh, you can join uh, right now. We have Dr. Phil Mandelovitz who took the training together with Lydia for seven hours in this studio. Grueling seven hours. Everybody here was, he was here. And these seven hours went by quickly. And Phil, who is already placing implants as a GP, Sutra Academy taught him the finesse of a periodontist. Okay, we, people think that we suture like in a fancy way. Not really. We have strategies and techniques now all exposed, all revealed to any general dentist or specialist that wants to learn that because soft tissues make a big difference, like Dr. Phil is saying. Again, Phil, a speedy recovery here. I'm going to be offering uh, a few bonuses for doctors who join uh, before, before uh, registration closes. Bonus number one is the 21 Protocols book. Okay, we can have it from there. It's in my, in my bag. Taylor, thank you. It's on the chair. The 21 Protocols is a book with multiple... Thank you. You can go to the screen. Okay. Uh, 21 Protocols book is a double-sided 90, 98 pages double-sided with 21 types of procedures procedures uh, from soft tissue grafting connective tissue grafting implants dealing with complications uncovering pedicle socket shielding sinus lifting crown lengthening functional aesthetic the protocols that I use, it's pretty dense. So I want this to, to, to be your checklist for you and your staff. And this is going to be mailed to you with Sutra Academy in the same package or, or separately, but it'll be sent to you at the same time. And bonus number two is the online course. It's a 997 value online course where you will see 21 videos describing each procedure where Dr. Rashad uh, Ryman and myself recorded in the studio, explaining the details with all the slides, uh, with all the information, all the Q&A, and all the important things that are usually a gap of knowledge that a lot of dentists have. Now you have it all laid, down to, laid out in a step-by-step -step way. So this is bonus number one and two, the book and the online training on the 21 protocols. Bonus number three, is the next level implant training that basically shows you the seven step uh, path from simple cases to doing big cases. So what we now find out is when you are placing one or two implants, you have a little bit of experience in small spans, one or two implants, the knowledge that you have, the set of skills that you have is not enough to do big cases. There is a seven step process that we reveal in this training. So this is bonus number three next implant training. We say, you know, what got you out of Egypt in the, in the spirit of this holiday? What got you out, out of Egypt is not going to get you to the Holy Land, okay? There's a certain process, there's a certain knowledge that you need to acquire to get to the big cases, and this is what we explore, especially as a general dentist. Bonus number four is something super important for implants. If you're going to place implants, you're going to have complications. This is a full-blown implant complication training that includes the clinical management of complication, complications, but also the psychological aspect of patient communication. What to say, what to talk, what not to say, how to communicate, and what are the different conversations we're going to have with our patients when our implants don't work and we have these problems. So all of that is included in bonus number four that is now given to you together with Sutra Academy. You'll also have access to our Surgical Mastermind Facebook group. It's a private group that has, uh, where doctors that are, took one or more of our courses 
have access to. And this is where you can post your cases. This is where you can communicate with me. This is where you can get my feedback and the other doctors on this platform on how you're doing. So Surgical Mastermind is included in Sutra Academy. Uh, Dr. Ilona Casalini that uh, trained on the ZPAD told me that she learned what I need to know about suturing. This is a doctor that doesn't perform that much surgery, but does some extractions, some basic procedures. Ilona felt the Z-pad feels real. Now, it's not real. This is made out of silicon, and it's not meant to simulate soft tissue, but in terms of how the needle passes through, how the tissues respond, we, f we now see that this is helping doctors to visualize the path of the needle. It helps, helps them show, helps them understand the movements and also how these flaps are being repositioned. So you can now take these techniques and use them in your practice, of course, using the other resources. If you have an atlas or anything like that, that would be great too. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Suturing atlas. So Suture Academy online course uh, is including, included in this training, the ZPA training, the suture atlas is included, the suturing kit, protocols book, the protocols online, the next level implant training, and implant complications. I'm also going to include this thing here. This is called the mini Z pad. Okay, so if this is the large Z pad, this is the mini. Okay, why did I create the mini? Number one, I wanted to create something for myself. When I created the Z-Pad, I asked my, my, my Z-Pad maker, the professional who made this, Ian, who made this Z-Pad for me, I asked him to make me a small, a small version of the Z-Pad, okay? A small version, why? Because I wanted a constant reminder that I need to work on that and I need to create it and it's also a great stress ball, okay? So I'm going to send you the mini Z-Pad as well, okay? It's coming with you with this training, okay? Surgical Mastermind. So the total value of this training, if you had to, you know, really travel, you had to leave your practice and pay for a hands-on course and go to a hotel and leave your practice and not produce all these, you know, all these days and be away from your family where your wife and your, your kids are not, <laughs> not super happy, uh, would be almost $7,500, so pretty, pretty hefty amount. Uh, like I said before, our goal is to have as many dentists train on this system. Our goal in the next five years is to have 10,000 dentists train in Suture Academy and train on the Z-Pad, and we wanted to make it more affordable. The whole training is now affordable at $1,997. You can pay it in full, which is probably a better deal, or you can pay it in two installments. You pay slightly more for the two installments, but both options can work for you. So the Sutra Academy is now open for registration, open for enrollment. Uh, we're excited to offer it again. Uh, we already have our graduates and we're starting to get our testimonials and our feedback back. We're excited about that. Uh, the domain name, the website to join is sutraacademy.com. Look at it, check it out. There's a video at the top. It talks about what's included. It's a pretty lengthy uh, video. If you need to watch the whole thing, if you're already uh, you know, convinced and you're ready know what you want, you know what you need, uh, you can just scroll down and join this training. You can pick your payment plan. Actually, the registration closes on, on, on April 7th, so we have Saturday. an extra day. Okay, you have an extra day to think about that, but pick your payment plan and you can immediately gain access for uh, Sutra Academy for the full training with all the different bonuses that are included here, uh, total value, Seven thousand four hundred ninety-seven. Seven thousand It's a big number. I can't pronounce it. Seven thousand four hundred seventy-nine dollars, and it's now discount, discounted about sixty, seventy percent. So we want to make sure it's more affordable. Okay, money back guarantee. It's uh, fully guaranteed. Take the training. Take the knowledge. Learn. Excel. If for whatever reason it's not what you thought, you were not blown away, you're not like 100% convinced that this was the right thing, no problem, send us an email, send an email to Taylor and we'll refund your money full, full ba fully back. So no risk whatsoever in taking this training. So registration is closing April 7th of this year, okay? Uh, take advantage of this offer, take advantage of 
all the different bonuses that are now offered for a limited amount of time. This offer is not going to be out after April 7th. Best way is to enroll today. If you're you know, thinking about it, this is the time where most doctors will take action. If you're just going to postpone things for tomorrow and the day after, you'll never do it. It's like you know, cleaning your car. You, know, you always postpone tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow and you end up not doing it and then your car is a mess. And we want to make sure that you can benefit from this training in Suture Academy. Awesome, just some insight from my perspective as a general dentist. Uh, I did a, a free gingival graft surgery on Saturday. You know, I, I did a great service for the patient. I used a lot of the, the things you taught tonight. I charged $1,200. I could have easily charged 2000 I wanted to help her out, but that's just from one surgery. Would I rather do that than do drill and fill dentistry and insurance-based dentistry all day? Heck yes. <laughs> you know, it's just taking you as a general dentist and putting you on a whole different level. Mm -hmm. And what you're teaching, you can really do that and feel confident that you're doing the right thing to your patients. Because I'm not going to go back to perio school right now or specialty school. It's that just not sense. in my, it, it's not in my uh, schedule. It's not in my wavelength. Uh, I enjoy what I'm doing, I love what I'm doing, and with current technology, I can sit at home, learn from you. Uh, I recommend any dentist who's serious, any general dentist who's serious about learning, to not necessarily find someone they respect, someone who they understand from, and take their courses and learn from them. And uh, for me, it's been, it's been you, so thank you, Ziv. My pleasure, y y you know, the, this training, was created with the novice in mind, with the general dentist in mind that doesn't want to go to Perry school or spend you know, months and years in continuums and mini residencies and, and go through all this training where you know, they spend thousands and tens of thousands of dollars ending up confused and overwhelmed. I didn't want that. So I wanted to have something that I would want as a dentist, as a resident. I, you know, this is, I created this because this is what I needed 20 years ago. Now, I, it took me 10, 15 years to feel comfortable in suturing so I can really pass on the message and the gospel to, about suturing. It, it took time because I was doing things really more on intuition and developed some skills and I did not think that they were anything special and actually when I started teaching suturing the, the, the way this came about I took a camera similar to the one that we have here and I filmed myself suturing and I noticed how I hold my instruments and I noticed how I pass my needle and how I twist and how I interlock and how I hold my needle and the pinky hold you will never see the words pinky holds in any book and if you mention it to any university professor, they'll think you're crazy. But the pinky, pinky hold is changing the world now. A lot of doctors are using it, and, and we know now why. Because it helps you with the suturing process. So I created something that was relatively simple and something that I wanted myself, and I wanted to streamline it and create almost like a suite of products with the book, the videos, the Z-pad, the materials. So when you get it, Taylor is shipping it to you, boom. You get it at home, you start working. That's what, I, that's what I envisioned. That was my, my vision. And that's why we have the mini Z-pad that reminded me. Thank you, Ziv. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing now your it's, knowledge. Now it's on my keychain, on my, on my car. Thank you for being open with your knowledge. My pleasure. Any questions? Yeah, let's answer some questions. Sure. Had a nice group of people tonight. Felt nice energy. Excellent. Uh, one question from guest number 4257. So would you rather... I like his name. <laughs> Is that Dr. Binder? So would you rather... Uh, you would rather extend into the bone further down in cases where you, you bone graft? Yes. If you have a site that is, was severely damaged and you know, you're concerned with the bone quality, you're concerned with encapsulation, well engage your implant in the native bone as well, if possible. It's not always possible, Rashant. It's not yeah. always possible. But if possible, engage the native bone that will give you the real stability, not fake stability, 
and you'll increase the chances of success. Awesome. Uh, guest number 7434. In a socket shield case where a flap is not required, what bird do you like to use to split the root and what material do you prefer to use to fill the rest of the socket and do you use a flattened collagen plug with crisscross sutures and periacryl if you are not placing an implant immediately? Okay, so the burr that I'm using is just a long shank burr, a surgical burr, I forgot the name, there's a number to it, and it's part, now we have kits, uh, socket shield kits that are now you know, available from different companies. I use a conventional allograft material. I usually mix it with PRF and mix it with some metronidazole as an antibiotic. And the plug on top is usually a, a collagen plug or a PRF plug. And when you uh, crisscross, I mostly call it an X suture. Mm -hmm. a very simple X suture that will keep the plug in place. Awesome. I, I, I love the, the case where you did a guided socket shield. Now, um, do you uh, run into issues when, wh when you're, if you're drilling into the root where it puts stress on your motor and causes it to break and really abrades your, the burrs, uh, the your implant burrs? How That's do you a great question. That's a very important question because when you drill into roots that are harder than bone, it'll wear your drills, number one. It's not going to do anything to the motor. No. The motor is well equipped, assuming it's a, it's a functioning motor, in a modern motor, it's well equipped to handle this type of drilling. Because sometimes we drill into very hard bone that is almost like a tooth. Mm -hmm. So I'm not concerned with that, that, but definitely it will wear on your drills, number one. Number two, because depending on the system, th the system that I'm using is tapered, it may mobilize the shield. Mm -hmm. That may happen. And like we saw in the case, I created a socket ring mm -hmm. unintentionally because I, I didn't notice that there was some part of it that was still there. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, uh, guest number 8620. Uh, he'd like to know about the treatment for Miller class 3 recession. Miller class 3 recession. So Miller class 3 is a type of recession where the interproximal bone is compromised. Where the recession is still coronal to the missing papilla and the success in root coverage is not a hundred percent so the approach uh, it's not about the actual technique it's more about the success rates because most techniques have similar success rates whether it's connective tissue grafting tunneling pinhole gumdrop or vista but when you start moving down in the Miller's classifications, moving to Miller's, Miller 3 and 4, the problem is the blood supply and the success is diminished. Okay, so it's not about the technique, it's about the success that you'll get with any technique. Okay. Okay. Um, and I, I naturally use all, all different techniques depending on the case. Okay. Um, I had a bone graft where the graft, Dr. 4257, I had a bone graft where the graft still shows dark on the panel. What it is, is, is it not vascular? So I guess the bone graft still looks dark. And when I go to place the implant, what are my steps? Do I remove the graft? Usually it shows spongy after bone graft integrates. Yeah. Well, if you have a dark spot where you did a bone graft, Number one, it teaches you that it's not mineralized or that there is a void. So your bone graft may have washed away, not worked fully, or it's not mineralized enough. So I would say it doesn't hurt to wait a little bit longer. So instead of two to three months, wait an additional month or two and then get a CT scan and then see what's happening there. You know, don't try to interpret a two-dimensional x-ray and understand what's happening three-dimensionally because sometimes you're pleasantly surprised and sometimes you're, you're unpleasantly not surprised, if you know what I mean, because ultimately what counts is the surgery, the actual placement. So don't get hung up so much on, an, on, on a two-dimensional PA, although it's a start, and it will tell you if the mineralization has completed. And if it did, move on to the CT scan. So 
go through and do the surgery and then assess well, at look the time. at look at the CT scan look at the CT scan and plan on what you have there based on that make some good surgical decisions whether you need sometimes it's obvious the bone graft did not work you need to graft again sometimes it looks like we have the volume but not the quality mm -hmm. so then you think about okay I'll, I'll move forward with the surgery but in the back of my mind it may be that as I drill into this bone graft it'll just fly out and it's not healed I may have to regraft again even postpone the implant placement there's definitely some improvement that needs to be done in the field of bone graft material and I think things are happening and hopefully cool uh, can you repeat the T suture T suture that concept okay I'll repeat the movement okay <laughs> T suture maybe like uh, T, time out <laughs> okay so T suture the, the st I guess the standing part of the T the vertical part of the T is the engagement in the in the flap and as you engage in the flap you pass it through that's the that's the vertical part the horizontal part is when you take the needle out and you engage from underneath the flap almost perpendicular to the vertical part so that's that's the T okay um, how would you see mineralization over a cone beam in the CT scan, how do you assess mineralization? How do I assess? So mineralization, you see in a cone beam, we are not calling it radio opacity or radio, de ra radio lucency. We call it... Density. Radio density, sorry, yes. We call it radio density. Mm -hmm. And the radio density, uh, some software can give you a certain value like Hounsfield units mm -hmm. number one but really don't overcomplicate your, 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 your thinking if something looks more white and with less voids and less specks just say it's condensed solid structure it's usually dense bone but you cannot tell about bone quality from a CT scan you need to actually drill into that drill into and because you may be surprised some th things that looks dense on bone they may not be as dense as you think they are. And then, yes, uh, if it feels flaky, what I, what I do, I take it out, I, I re-graft, and I live another day. Yep. The graft felt flaky while doing the osteotomy. It, when you encounter that, uh, how do you handle that? I complete the osteotomy mm -hmm. because it may fa feel flaky initially. Because don't forget, a, don't forget something really important. That, that, that's going to help a lot of dentists. Okay, let's look at that for a second. Okay, thanks. So a socket, a socket heals the following. This is a socket. A socket heals. How a socket heals. How a socket heals. How a socket heals. Give it a title. Yeah. It heals from the bottom up, from the bottom up, and from the sides in. From the bottom up, and from the sides in. Even from the sides in, it heals more here, the bottom, than from the top. And what does it mean? So as the socket heals, it's going to heal like that. This is the pattern. Okay? It's like concentric structures. So as it's done healing, the least healed part is this part right in here. This, this heel part, this part will feel a little bit denser, denser, and denser. So what does it mean? When you drill into the socket, it may feel flaky, flaky at first, not that good, but as you go deeper and lateral, sideways, you're going to start engaging better bone. And if you keep it in mind, you're not going to freak out when it initially feels like, oh, this doesn't feel good. Move on to the next drill. 
complete your osteotomy and then see. Now, you may have a full socket that did not heal at all for whatever reason. But go through the process, go through the osteotomy because now you know how it heals from the bottom up, from the sides in. And the least healed is kind of in the middle top. Simple? Love it. And sometimes, you know, uh, you can add some bone graft or whatever you use sure. on the coronal, Very right? commonly. Commonly. Very commonly. You see, when I started placing implants, I was almost disappointed or thinking I did something wrong when I placed my implant and the bone was not perfect. It's rarely per perfect. It's more common than not that the bone is not going to be ideal and then you have to add some mineral at the same time. Um, question... I saw an ad for Super GP. What happened to that project, uh, Doctor Guest Number Four Two Five Seven? You answer. Um, it's in the works. Our, we really want to blow your minds with that one. So uh, it's it's being in the works and it's gonna be unprecedented. I'll promise What's you. What's coming in Surgical Master? In I'm, I'm asking a question. In Surgical Master? What's coming? Well. There's many things that I think people out there need help with. Bone grafting is a key thing that needs to be addressed and uh, have a, a socket shielding is another thing that uh, just simplifying that, making it more accessible to people and, uh, you know, using the techniques that you're, you know, you're the guided is, is an amazing way that can make it. And as a general dentist who did attempt one socket shield <laughs> and aborted it and Aye. felt uh, didn't feel very good about it, I, I feel there is a great need for that education out there and yeah. uh, the way you systemize things and educate people, I think you can add a lot of value and, and make a lot of ridges not resorb. I saw a picture the other day of uh, one tooth with a socket shield and next to it, oh, yeah. no That's socket amazing. shield. I'm like, wow, I mean, you know. Yeah, the socket shield, you see, uh, the socket shield is not a new thing. The socket shield has been around for 20 years. It's be it became more popular. Some groups are claiming, you know, we did it and everybody else is bastardizing the technique. I heard this, I heard this expression from someone. Uh, and it's not about bastardizing. It's a difficult technique that needs to be explored. It needs to be taught properly. It needs to be tried and practiced and learning from some mistakes and other, other people's mistakes so you can uh, offer this to your patients, really important. And, and really what our goal in Surgical Masters is to be a comprehensive solution for surgical treatment in, in, in your practice. That includes bone grafting, soft tissue grafting, implants, management, how to deal with your assistant, how to communicate. So we're going to have some projects this year that have to do with soft tissue education. So you don't have to go to pinhole and gumdrop and tunneling and vista and take all of the, we want to have one course that is going to teach you everything that you need to know about soft tissue grafting. And we have our implant accelerator uh, that focus on, focuses on bringing you to the next level in implant uh, training. And something we're really excited about is our upcoming inner circle. So we're going to have our inner circle, the surgical master inner circle, which is the closest of the closest doctors. Uh, joining this group, which will be a monthly membership, more information coming up, where you will have the opportunity to be mentored personally by me every month on a regular basis. Because the reality is what's happening right now is it's impossible for me and for Dr. Ryman to answer all the emails in terms of questions, clinical questions. What to do here, what to do there. So we needed to create a smaller group where we are focusing on answering questions and mentoring and coaching and guiding so you too can experience success. So this is one, you know, beyond, you know, moving on to other, other, um, other projects and other, other things that, that will be discussed. Uh, we want to really be your go-to resource of knowledge and training in your practice. So you don't have to travel, you don't have to really spend thousands, you can, wherever you're at in the world, uh, Sutra Academy being part of it. Sutra Academy is really one of those things that we are very proud of. Uh, we, we pulled it off, you know, from, from nothing in a short peri period of time, but really the work on it and the creation of the content and the Z-pad uh, took a few years and was perfected over time. You, you will soon see a video on how it was created in my garage. The first versions, there was a Z-pad 0, 0 0.1, 
now we're at 2.0. So and and really, uh, Ziv, w w I'm so grateful because your mindset, you know, you're, you're very well respected. You you do things on a very high level, and yet you haven't forgotten about those people out there, those doctors who are good-hearted, ethical doctors who want to do the best for their patients. They just want to learn from someone they mm -hmm. can trust who does not hide knowledge and does open source learning with, uh, with them, you know. S mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's one of the biggest gifts that, um, that you bring to this world. You, you really help people who, who really want to grow and succeed, not just by telling them do this, do that, but by really sort of empowering them. And, and that's sometimes all we need is a little encouragement. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I do this I do this intentionally. You do? I do this intentionally. <laughs> it is not like a coincidence, uh, you know, empowerment and motivation and inspiration. I do this intentionally in my training, in my lectures, and even in today's training. I, I always like to use some quotes. I like to maybe lead by example, and I want to show you what to do when things don't go well and show you that, you know, to err is human. To err is human. It's, it's not something that you can ever get rid of. You, you will never be perfect. We can strive for that. But the goal in our training is to show you things that are in the simplest way, the most predictable way, get rid of the confusion, get, get rid of like overwhelm people. Like, you know, they're getting, a lot of dentists are getting educated and taking courses and learning, but when they get to do it, they get overwhelmed. Why? Because they overanalyze. They actually have too much knowledge. Yeah. They're kind of, their brain is scattered. So what we wanted to do in Surgical Master, and specifically with Sutra Academy, is limit it. Make it like the basic elements. That's all you need to know. That's all I do. Everything in Sutra Academy is what I do. It's distilled. It's distilled. Exactly. Like distilled water. And, and there's so much value to simplicity because, okay, I, I can have a whole room filled with surgery books. Am I going to really read them? <laughs> but if I have a step-by-step -step guidance, then I'm more likely to actually execute on it. Yeah. You know, I it's interesting. You see, uh, the, this book, this protocol, is, it's a really simple, really simple book. Okay. Very simple. There are 21 protocols with all the techniques. Now, this is double-sided. This is not like lots of spaces. It's not probably not the best from a graphic design. It's not like a piece of art. It's probably small fonts here, but it's dense with information. And it shows you step-by-step step what to do, how to hold the exact medications, the exact post-op instructions, plus the photos, plus at the end of each chapter, you have a summary and it shows you for example this procedure the direct sinus augmentation protocol is 16 steps 16 steps and this is what you need to know and so on and so forth so this is basically what is included in this book uh, from socket shielding to connective tissue grafting to pedicle grafts to osteotome technique to crown lengthening uh, free gingival grafts everything is right here in the book called the protocols and this is your checklist and together with this one this is one of our bonuses you will have you have access to an online program where you watch the videos per protocol and guess what if you have a question or something is not clear post the question below the video I answer right away and this is really what is offered today so we appreciate uh, your help your your attendance we appreciate your commitment and commend you for spending the time, spending the energy while you could be doing something else. You could be sleeping, you could be going out, you could be working. Some of you guys are now, it's early in the morning, somewhere uh, out of the United States. And some of, some of you, it's the middle of the night and you woke up to watch this broadcast, whether it was on social media or on the broadcast page, it doesn't matter. If I gave you one tip today, one or two small tips that you can immediately utilize tomorrow. I can sleep tonight. Rashad can sleep tonight. And we will sleep because we know that we provided now three and a half hours of content, of free education 
to a large community of thousands of doctors watching this broadcast on, on, on different, uh, the different socials. And for the doctors that want to take their suturing skills to the next level, now is an opportunity to join Suture Academy uh, all the way until April 7th. Uh, take advantage of this offer. The 50 videos, the Z-pad is going to be shipped to you, the suturing kit, the sutures, everything that you need to have to learn how to suture like a periodontist in a short period of time. It's not going to take you months or years. You're going to learn all these things immediately. Uh, you can watch the suturing atlas. It is now included in it. Uh, there are four bonuses, the protocols book, protocols course, the next level implant training, the implant complication training. You're getting our little mini Z-pad. You can immediately join our Surgical Mastermind on Facebook. You can join today at sutureacademy.com. Go there, there's nothing to lose. There's a full money back guarantee. It's fully guaranteed. You can take the training, there's no risk. Go through this training, go through the videos, practice on the Z-pad, look at the Atlas, incorporate these techniques in your practice, get the confidence and the knowledge that you need and the clarity when it comes to surgery. Get your soft tissue surgeries, your suturing skills to the next level and enjoy what you're doing. This is really what we do. You see, we've been, we've been talking for about three and a half hours, almost four hours, and I gave a two-hour broadcast before that. You did. Okay, and, and I don't feel it. I could go like for two, two, three hours. I just have to go, go home to put my kids to sleep. That's it, and, and, and be with my wife. But other than that, I, we are so passionate about teaching and providing value and our hope for you is that you'll experience what we are experiencing in our practicing, in, in our practice. What we are fortunate to have here uh, can now be shipped to you. Any final words? We are at the cusp of a revolution in the way dental education and education in general is being disseminated. Those of you guys who realize this, this internet thing is crazy. <laughs> like what used to take you years to learn uh, that's not the case anymore and those who are realizing that are really you know making leaps in how they learn and I'm one of them I realize the power of this internet and uh, the power of connecting with people across the world who have techniques and skills that I want to learn and we are without borders anymore you can be anywhere and learn anything you can learn how this awesome periodontist treats some of the world's most recognized faces and most demanding patients with excellence, even if you are in Goa, India. <laughs> so it's I need to get there to go. Go I've full, been, full one parties. I've been there. <laughs> I love it. Goa is beautiful. So uh, I just you know we 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 really I think want to make a difference for those people who take action because there's a lot of dentists out there who want to grow and and move forward and there you only have a limited time and the way the biggest impact can be made is to really focus on these dentists who are action takers who want to go to that next level who realize the value of mentorship and uh, the biggest thing you helped me with is environment uh, basically setting up your surroundings in a way that is positive and and focusing on the good things in life. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's uh, that's my last words. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm grateful and thanks for everyone who watched us. And um, I'm sure people benefited. Uh, it was our goal. Thank you, Russia. This this was great. And 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 the the key to success, the key to double what you're doing, to triple, quadruple, to 10x what you're doing in life is massive action. Action is rewarded by the universe. You cannot sit in your own shell, in your own practice, not venture out and not learn things and get better and improve and risk complications and problems. You gotta go out there. But when you take massive action, when you learn, when you spend the time on yourself, if you're investing in yourself, money and time and energy, that's really important. It's very similar to, you see, if, if, and for most people, human nature is as such, if you would offer the average person 
a million dollars and you offer them a book on how to make a million dollars, most people will take the million dollars. Most people. And maybe I would too. I don't know. I never, I never had this. Uh, you know, nobody ever offered me. But conceptually, think about it. If somebody can, gives you a book on how to make a million dollars, you know, with the same book, you can make it over and over and over again as opposed to just getting it one time. And it's very similar to education. You can learn from a book. You can learn from a mentor, a teacher, from a system, Sutra Academy. This knowledge doesn't go away. It doesn't go down the drain. It stays within you, in your brain, in your muscle memory, in your eye and mind training that you're getting in the system. And you can implement it every day. No, no, no doubt about it. You implement it. And if it doesn't work for you, then you let us know. We send it back. And the sooner, no you, risk. The sooner you start, really, the, the better. If I started on this path that I started on three years ago with you when I first got out of dental school, I'd probably be retired now. <laughs> you never know. You, we don't want to retire. I don't, what well, are we going to do in retirement? I'd, I'd at least have the option to. You see, I don't know. We'll see. I don't want to retire. There's a lot of, uh, ahead of us. There's a lot of things that we're planning to do. Uh, I love practicing. It's my life. I practice five days a week as a specialist, specialist in a very competitive envi environment. I, I enjoy it. I couldn't live without that. I love going in there and, and, and doing the work and running the practice and doing the surgeries and dealing with problems. But I also love teaching, so I found the perfect marriage where I don't have to travel, I don't have to go, go around the world. I can sit here in our studio, at, in, in my practice, document, and disseminate this knowledge to great doctors like you. So on that note, uh, we again appreciate you, we commend you, we salute you for being with us for almost four hours here on this broadcast, live broadcast here from the Beverly Hills studio, from s the Surgical Master Studio. Thank you so much, Michael our broadcasting specialist, Taylor, our assistant. Thank you so much for a great work and taking care of all the doctors that are joining us. Uh, join today, suturacademy.com. Suture Academy is open for registration. It's not going to be open for very long, only until April 7th. Take advantage of all the different bonuses, everything that is shipped for you. It's a fully guaranteed program. I look forward to working with you. I look forward to coaching and mentoring you and getting your surgical skills, your suturing skills, to an extra super level. On that note, have a great night. God bless. To grab your spot before registration closes because we're about to close the doors and kick things off. So go ahead and do this right now while it's on your mind and you're still thinking about it. Okay, I'll leave you with that for now. Simply click on the button below, complete your enrollment form, and I'm going to see you on the inside. Thank you and have a great day. So this is called a Z-Pad. Okay, and uh, you can guess that this is a sh size and shape of an iPad, but it's a Z-Pad because my name is Ziv. And basically what it is, it's a game. It's a game where doctors that are training and suturing go through different tasks. It's, let's call it basic training and suturing. And at the end of the course, at the end of the curriculum, they get it, they know how to suture, they get confidence. And, you know, they call me and say, you know what, I, I know how to suture. And, and I put it to the test, Howard, you won't believe what I did. I took somebody who's not a dentist. He's never touched a handpiece. He doesn't have a dental degree. I put him through the suturing training. And after the course was seven hours. After seven hours, he got results on the Z-pad that are better than some of the dentists. Can you imagine that? You can be excellent in suturing. The thing that I found about the Z-Pad was that it gave you the opportunity to really put your, your challenges into specific formats. Instead of just thinking about the technique of suturing, you actually got to apply it to each situation, whether it was um, a situation where you're closing an edentulous incision space, it, whether you're doing um, a socket graft, and you're going to not only think about the technique, but you get to apply the technique specifically right. on a project that it, it works. So this is a sh size and shape of an iPad. Basically what it is, it's a game where doctors that are training and suturing go through different tasks. It's, let's call it basic training and suturing. And at the end of the course, at the end of the curriculum, 
they get it. They know how to suture. They get confidence. I took somebody who's not a dentist. He's never touched a handpiece. He doesn't have a dental degree. I put him through the suturing training. After seven hours, he got results on the Z-pad that are better than some of the dentists. Can you imagine that? I think the Z-pad changes everything. This is so realistic. And now that I've done surgeries for a few years and doing placing implants myself, and even I'm practicing again today, I feel that this is the most realistic way to learn to do it. It actually is probably of all the hands-on, non-patient materials that I've used, it's probably one of the more accurate ones. It definitely feels a lot like gingiva. The tissue sort of approximates similarly the way the gingiva does. Just X, simple X sutures, horizontal mattress. Um, this is just another X, a horizontal X. Uh, we have a, a continuous sling suture here for uh, coronal repositioning of flaps. Um, you know, it's it's not gingiva at the end of the day, so there are some things that you just won't ever be able to emulate uh, outside of uh, in vivo live patient treatment. But uh, this is definitely probably the best one. It's um, really easy to use, and um, I've learned a lot, and very similar to uh, soft tissue, <laughs> so it makes it very. Um, you know, hands-on and um, lifelike. It's the culture and it's the people. I felt like home. I met today people here from all over the world, from Saudi Arabia to Algeria to Canada to Russia. I've gone to a lot of CE courses. You can see the gray hair, but I've never been to any kind of meeting like this. They break it down to you. You just understand it. You know, you don't need to do anything. It's just so easy to understand. I mean, where else are you going to find a guy from Lebanon and a guy from Israel collaborating at such a high level? You finally go to a course where they promise you learn certain skills and they give you more. And the difference and the change in the mindset with what Ziv and Rashad are doing is really being honest, uplifting others, and no one else does that. The way the materials were presented were a way that I can go back on Monday morning tomorrow and do any of the procedures. I feel very comfortable and it's been a very, it's been actually one of the best experiences of my life. There were situations that I would put an implant in, but looking at how Dr. Simon would do it, I was getting good results. He was getting great results. So it allowed me in that aspect to take it to the next level. You, while listening to the lecture, there are times that, you know, I want to take a break and go to the bathroom, but I, I didn't want to miss what they were going to say. That's, that's how adamant I was to absorb everything that, you know, they were saying. There were just a lot of aspects of this course that provided clarity for me. The things that I already do, but I feel like I'll do better when I go back. I cannot wait to go back to Ottawa and to implement this technique because, my God, it's beautiful. I was expecting a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. He gave me a 50. The course super exceeded my expectations. Dr. Ziv Simon is amazing. He is a great educator and excellent mentor. I really enjoyed this course and uh, interacting with Dr. Simon and also all the other surgical masters who enrolled. It's been a fantastic uh, learning experience and I fully recommend it to anyone out there, be it a beginner or someone who's experienced. Um, I believe there's, there's always something out there to learn. Ziv comes from a place of abundance and he's elevating the standard of care. Um, I highly, highly recommend uh, his course. I'm absolutely indebted to Dr. Ziv Simon for opening a whole new world of surgical pedodontics to me. He is a phenomenal mentor. I just saw one of his YouTube videos. I got hooked to them and watched video after video. Uh, the thing that I really like about Ziv's uh, teaching philosophy is that he tries to teach you uh, how to do these type of surgeries in a predictable and safe fashion. Surgical master is 
giving me a huge inspiration in dental surgeries and it keeps pushing my limits all the time. Hey Ziv, I just want to thank you for all the time and effort that you put into creating all your videos and PowerPoints and everything that you do for us general dentists. Every week I listen and I read to what you've produced and every time I do that kind of work in my practice it does help me immensely and I always use your words of wisdom to, to make sure that I'm doing a, a good job. Dr. Simon is an excellent teacher. He goes above and beyond by not just giving us an algorithm to follow. What he does is he goes in depth um, through the whole decision-making process that has to happen in order to uh, treat these uh, surgical cases properly and um, in order to be prepared for these cases as well. Um, I am just glad that I took the course and uh, I can't wait to implement everything that I've learned so far. For me, beyond just learning those concepts, um, having Ziv to answer my questions, um, having the forum, um, it's helped give me the confidence to implement what I've learned, which is extremely important.